fact that there is so much fishing experiences crammed into Australia, I think that's why we just get absolutely hammered and there's so many different types of lures. Like certain times of the year, trout will attack pretty much anything. Some times of the year in that clean, what they call gin clear water, they're very, very tricky. Um, but I mean, Australian salmon, if you get them in a little bit of moving water, as long as you turn and burn, what we call it turn and burn, throw a halco slice, rip it through where you think they are and you'll get some fish. I fear that if they did go down and say, hey, we're going to ban live bait. And there'd be people in the fishing community, they're like, oh, okay, like, yeah, I don't live bait. Um, doesn't really affect me specifically. And not fight against it. That's, this is the thing that- And um, it's just a domino. Yeah, it's, it's absolutely crazy. And it's a very worrying situation. Welcome back, Accurate Hunts, A Life Outdoors. Now, it's not very often I talk to other podcasters. It's actually a lie. I speak to a couple. But these guys popped up. Oh, maybe it was the $3,000 they sent on sponsored posts or something. I'm not sure. But in every page that I'm on, in every feed, in Instagram, in Facebook, the world was telling me I need to talk to some guys from Tasmania. And they were busy. But I got on Dylan and Hooch from the Snag Podcast. Welcome, boys. G'day, Thanks g'day. Thanks for having us. No worries. So these guys have set up a, a weekly podcast down there, which, you know, good luck to you. That's hard to belt out. I've been on that weekly front and it's a fishing based podcast, which interests me greatly because I am a horrible fisher person or a fisher them, as some would say. Um, and, you know, I got you on to pick your brains. Uh, Hooch has got a bit of hunting background. Dylan's got not a whole lot of background. He's only 12. So it's. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Basically, uh, basically, he looks like he, looks like he is. But uh, uh, to be fair, he's twenty. Yeah, <laughs> twenty, twenty. We're still yet to see any shaving. Still got a two in it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it does have a two in it. So we're going to rip through some stuff tonight. Uh, we're going to have some fun. I want to. I want to talk about uh, how it works in Tasmania. Your guys' background, um, fishing in general, and then a couple of specialty stuff. Uh, I know you guys do a lot of trout stuff as well. So that that definitely interests me. I have a lot of them local to where I am. And it's something I'm interested in in pursuing. So if we can get a little like elevator pitch, 10 second, 20 second, 30 second intro on Dylan, you rip in and then I'll, I'll go across to Hooch. Right. Well, my name is Dylan Richards. As we mentioned earlier, I run Fish Australia, which is like a social media platform on YouTube and all of that. And uh, do like fishing videos all around Tassie, mainly trout fishing, but like do inshore saltwater fishing as well as a little bit of offshore whenever I can. Um, but yeah, recently jumped on the Snag podcast with Hooch and Tom and Dean, which aren't on the podcast today. But um, yeah, it's pretty good, pretty fun. But yeah, over to you, Hooch. How did you meet those guys? Um, so pretty much uh, about six years ago when I was, Oh, God, even younger than 12. <laughs> yeah, about six. No, I was about um, 14. And um, I think I had oh, like 50 subscribers and was down Hobart scene, actually watching footy. And um, went into the Fisherman Shed, which is Tom's tackle shop down Hobart, and just went in there and cried wolf and said, oh, I do YouTube videos and a little squeaky voice. And Tom, Tom loved it and he just sort of watched watched me just take it as a step and step and step and step and ended up uh, sort of getting closer and closer to working with Tom and stuff like that. And then last year, we he had a um, person fall out last minute for AFTA, which is a big fish and trade show, that, which we just got back from in Goldie. And he had someone fall out and he sent me a message like on a Monday night saying, is there any chance you can get the rest of the week off and come to Hobart like tomorrow night and go to Goldie and do a heap of promo work for me? And yeah, it's just and Dylan's like, yeah, I'm yeah. on my way. I've got the got the week off. Let me ring the school and see if I can get off. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and um, yeah, pretty much just went from there. And Dean is a close mate of Tom's, and then Hooch just sort of. Just wandered in, just lurked into the background, and here he is. Murchie Hooch, what's your background? How did you end up in this crew? 
just before I start, I might mention that you do a range of lures as well, Dylan. Trout yeah. lures, but um, I won't go. I won't go right into that. People can look for them um, themselves. Um, I got mixed up because uh, Tom asked. Um, <laughs> I I I should say no to people a lot more. Um, my dad would say that because he's always mentioning how tall my lawn is and uh, my yard needs to tidy. But Tom just asked and I said, I said yes. So a bit of my background, I'm Tassie born and bred. Um, I grew up with a fishing rod in one hand and, a, and an air rifle in one, the other, and then life just gets in the way, um, you know, with work and, and raising your own family. But over the years, I've had a real healthy mix of uh, motorbikes and four drives, outdoors, fishing and hunting. Um, I worked in some trades and then I worked at a paper mill, which was shift work, which allowed me to get away a bit. It was a pretty good roster. And then that um, wound up and I was asked to help those people that lost their jobs into new roles. And then I made my own uh, job. When that finished, that was a contract. And I became a sales agent for fishing and hunting gear, uh, which I quite enjoyed. Um, and now I work for a, a peak body called Tarfish. So we're responsible and, and like to be the conduit to 130-odd thousand recreational fishers in, in Tasmania. So that's my day job. I've got to be fairly careful because I have to play a fairly straight bat uh, and make sure I get my foot out to the line of the wicket on most days with that, whereas normally my life is about rocking back onto the back foot and just carting everyone over the back fence. So I have to sort of um, be very uh, succinct and politically correct at times, but I'm off the chain tonight, so anything could happen. Yeah, and they're probably not listening to me, so... You know, we can look out. Uh, she's go time. We, we can <laughs> delve into where did Hoot, where did Hooch come from? It's a nickname. Uh, people think it's drugs predominantly, but it's not. I was in the surf club in 1988. I was sitting out. I was grade ten, and I was sitting outside the surf club, and this big burly, bikey looking dude said, uh, "Have you ever rode a surf boat?" And I said, "No." And he said, "Well, you do now." And he practically picked me up and dragged me like a kitten because he was a fairly big dude. I wasn't a small chap, but he was way bigger than me, and he dragged me out to what they called the bronze medallion. Uh, and, and they were two days into it, and I had to play some catch-up, and I got my bronze medallion and became a surf boat role, which I thoroughly enjoyed. It was some of the greatest time of my life rowing surf boats and being in the surf club. And um, the guy that fixed the surfboards, the, the paddle boards and the surf skis, took his missus out at the time to a movies in, uh, might have been 89, when Turner and Hooch came out. And about two days later, he said, I'm going to nickname you Hooch. I said, what is that? And he said, well, I watched this movie and you remind me of the dog. Anyway, it stuck and he never really said why, but months later when it came out on uh, VHS, that's how long ago, Dylan, you ever seen a VHS? Wouldn't have thought so. And so well, um, you wouldn't even see the DVD, would you, Dylan? <laughs> anyway, <laughs> um, I watched it on v- yeah. CDs. I, I, was, uh, I watched it and I was mortified because I wasn't sure whether it was because I dribbled as much as that dog or what, but it was no, it was because of the way the dog eats and runs around busting. <laughs> apparently that was that was me. So it's stuck. <laughs> Poor mum gets Mrs. Hooch, dad gets Miss Mr. Hooch. No one knows my name, Kelly. I've had mates that were like 20 year friends ring me up and say, Oh, Hooch, apparently you know some Kelly Hunt person that's got old Falcon parts. I said, uh, Glenn, that's me, you idiot. Oh, yeah. Oh, all right. So yeah, that's where, that, that's where that's where that that's where that You got any nicknames, Dylan? Uh, not really. Uh, just so. Sort of, oh wow! Here we go again. Um, no, nah, just pretty. We were keeping it clean. Hey? Sorry. Yeah, yeah. That's <laughs> you're the one person that asked. Um, I caught fish in Australia a fair bit. Food and headers. Fish a fair bit, but nothing really. Just fish in Australia is basically it, or just Dylan really. So, how about you? Do the, you have the any? The boys have told me that. Uh, well, I'll get to that in a second. The boys have told me that. Like a fish, you've got some pretty colours and pretty, you know, pictures on the side of you, a bit like a nice little rainbow trout or your coloured stickers, tough stickers. Yeah. And tattoos. You've got a, got a couple of questionable ones, but it's funny. We can we can get there later <laughs> on. funny but... now. <laughs> uh, no, keep your shirt on, I think. Exactly. Uh, look, nicknames-wise, nickname-wise for me, um, I've never said this publicly out loud, but Dodge isn't my real name and I don't need to tell you what it is, but most people don't realise that. And it uh, it stemmed from my dad. He called me that when I was born. Like that was his nickname for me my whole life. 
And it wasn't until I started working with him when I was 17, 18, I suppose, 18 or 19. Um, we did fencing. He's a fencer. Went to work with him and everyone started calling me that. And then I got into the hunting and it stuck. I ran with that. I, I don't actually remember a time where I said, oh, I'm going to run, like change name from real name to nickname. But it just became a thing and now it's no one knows me as anything else. Yeah. And I kind of like to keep, keep it that way. Not that it matters. I just like it better than my real name. But yeah. the, the where it come from is my my dad's an Elvis fan and Elvis's grandma used to be called Grandma Dodge. So I'm named after an old lady. <laughs> there you go. So let's go. <laughs> and it's funny nicknames. I mean, they'll stick. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that, like- I, I mean, Dodge works. I've done a lot of work in the States and it's a memorable name for them because Dodge car is much more of an oh. icon over there. So, <laughs> yeah. oh, you're the Aussie guy, Dodge. Like, it's just everyone knew it. Yeah. So it was easy. It's it's funny like that. Go, though. Like when we were um when we were up in Gold Coast and we were doing all these little promo videos, like it we, it was always just oh it's blah 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 it's Dylan or Fish Australia from Snag Podcast and then what we were looking at, and like I didn't even know what I was saying when I was like oh it's Dylan from Snag Podcast. It's just like I'm so used to saying it's Fish Australia. It's like. Who the hell is Dylan? It's just whenever I'm behind yeah. the camera, it's just Fish Australia, Fish Australia, Fish. It's just nothing else. It was so weird to actually go. Oh, it's the only Dylan. people that the only people that call my real names, a couple of people at church, mum, and the wife when she's cranky at me or something. My son actually ran up the hallway the other day, yelling out my name like he's two, so he usually just calls me dad. And he come running up the hallway saying my name. It was, it was I recorded. It was very funny. Just. <laughs> And, you know, we, um, at our church, we, you know, if, if you come to the church, we would call you, um, like the kids would refer to you as Uncle Hooch or Uncle yep. Dylan. Um, so he, cause we go to church and everyone calls me, you know, Uncle Dodge. Then he thought that was my name. Like, so he would talk, he would talk to me and say, Hey, Uncle Dodge. I'm like, no, I'm your, I'm your dad. <laughs> like, I'm not, I'm not your uncle. But it's hard to explain that when that's what they hear you get called. How was uh, how was after? So is that a um, what does it stand for first? Australian Fishing Tackle Association. So the Australian it- Fishing Tackle Association sort of controls the industry, uh, and they have members. So the members are predominantly the stores, yeah. the stores, and also the manufacturers and right. importers. So is it open to public or trade only? Never used to be, oh, no. but last year and this year. And I think they will do it. It's a four-day conference with the last day being open to the public. And it's quite a success. I think there was 4,000 people there. And, and uh, Dylan, we missed out on it. But you you would have noted last year that how good it was. Could they shop or just look? No, they got free no, stuff and some giveaways and, and some prizes, but no shopping. No, we, right. we didn't do the um, it, open day last year either. Just Oh, like, didn't you? No, after... After like two or three days of walking around, looking at a thousand fishing lures, it's like it's nice to just have a day to relax and realise you're in Gold Coast, you're not in Tassie, it's not five degrees, and actually just do something other than yeah. just look at fishing gear and go on. <laughs> What'd you do? Go down Cav Ave and check out the meter maids. Did I'm you go out while baby. you're up there? Yeah. Maybe. No. <laughs> Are you even legal allowed to drink up there? <laughs> Dylan did go out, but given the nature of this podcast, I don't think we should go into too much detail of what Dylan got up to. What we did do one night, and I'll, and I'll let you uh, listeners know if they're ever in that uh, broad beach area, there was a place that we found accidentally called the Vault. Vault. And yeah. we're sitting there and the Vault, and we're sitting there and there's a guy on the piano and because of the bifold doors, well, they're more than bifold, there was five or six panels, so whatever that is, fold doors, and we couldn't really see too much. We could see the big piano and the bloke on the piano was good and he had a great voice and it was like a heap of range and it was like, wow, and we're trying to get a look and the people sitting next to me could see and they said, well, he's got he's, he's the chef. I'm like, what do you mean he's the chef? So he moved and he's got the chef kit on, proper chef kit with the chef hat and we thought, well, that's a bit random. Anyway, our food came out. We didn't think much of it. It was just tapas and we, we ordered some stuff to share and we got into it. I think the boys were pretty hungry. And then all of a sudden I turn around and here's the guy with the chef kit on on the guitar playing the guitar, guitar if he's mates with Jimi Hendrix and belting out these songs. He was phenomenal, wasn't he, Dylan? Yeah, he was good. And harmonica at one stage too. 
just pulled everything oh, out. The ham- he was off his. He was <laughs> sensational. So if you get up there to the Broadie, What's check out it? the vault. I'll put it on the to do list. Have you got any hidden talents, Dylan? Uh, musical skills? Not really musical. I used to um, dabble in footy, but that got in the way of fishing. So now she's just full fishing every weekend. So I'm how is footy skills it. musical? He said hobbies. <laughs> oh, I thought you just said musical skills. I've no, got hid- zero. hidden skills. Oh, hidden, hidden skills. skills. I've got zero. Uh, I've got zero musical talent, but I am the world record Phil Maney pie eating champion. I got that down to 27.53 seconds. If anyone can eat two Phil Maney pies and drink a can of Coke in under that, they can have at it. Yeah, right. That, did you get a photo on the wall or plaque or is that a gold uh, Video. Every time I walk in, he gives me a free pie. So – I know this is not shooting or fishing, but back well, we haven't in even the... done any shooting or fishing. Oh, no, yet. no, it's crazy. But back in, the... in. <laughs> but no, I, I love food talk, so let's go. Well, back in uh, the surf club days, uh, there was Justin Phoebe. He was a dear mate of mine. He was a little bit younger than me, and he had some older sisters. And I like to spend a lot of time at his house because his older sisters were foxy ads. We woke up about four days before Christmas, and his sister cooked us some muffins, and then the other sister said, "Oh." I'm going to drive. We didn't have a license. She said, well, I want to drive down to the supermarket. Anyone want to come and give me a hand? I'm like, yep. I mean, the tank, Mambo tank top and some surf shorts, bare feet, off I go. And so she ducked off down the aisles, none of my business, and they had this bit of a thing. Phil Maney was doing a, a bit of a promotion, and it was a pie-eating thing. And I'm just hiding because at that stage I, I didn't do anything in front of a microphone or camera at all. At that stage I was not interested. Anyway, the guy that was helping him spotted me. And he used to run the local um, takeaway store. And he said, oh, there's Kelly, because I wasn't hooched to him then. He goes, here's Kelly, a young lad from Forth. He's pretty good on the tooth. We'll get him out of here. So out I went. Long story short, I obliterated that field. Uh, they were eating them in like three minutes, two pies, two warm pies and a can of Coke in three minutes. And I'd done it full of muffins from the breakfast in about a <laughs> minute and ten. And so that was that, and I won. I got I got uh, a couple of days before Christmas. We we're doing a we we're doing a um, a thing at the surf club, and there was a big esky and some towels and all this pies and coke and this brig coke umbrella. And I gave it all away. I don't think I've got a thing to show for it. But then, um, many many years later, I heard that a big uh, New Zealand guy uh, beat my time and went fifty two seconds. Uh, that was fair enough. I didn't think much of it. But then many, many moons later, he shut down. He had pie stores around the, the state. He shut down and he started up again in, in Coiba, Devonport, and, and he said he had a bit of a promo about his pie eating and I was about to have a gastric sleeve, which I've had now. But So I was 158 kilos and I'm about 108 now. And um, so I thought before I have this gastric sleeve, I'm going to have a crack at this New Zealander. So I bought one pie. Uh, I bought two pies, but one was a practice because I figured if I could get one pie down the quick. And I approached it scientifically and I worked it out and I worked out and a couple of mates helped me. If I turned the pie upside down and squeezed it, it made a banana shape and fitted the same shape as my gullet. So I only had to sort of bite it twice. You can see where the hooch nickname come from. So I've bitten this thing twice and chewed it and swallowed it, slammed the coat down, kept kept a little bit to wash the next one down because that's tricky, and I got somewhere close. Uh, to 35. So I smashed his record and I said to someone stupidly, I reckon I can go sub 30. And um, my mum was helping me film that particular effort um, and she thought I was actually going to choke to death, so she mucked up the filming of it at all. But but then I got my mate to uh, help me film and I think, I, yeah, I'm pretty sure it was um, 27 seconds and 50-something. 50, 50 um, but if that gets beaten, it'll be a phenomenal effort so they can have a crack at it. So two warm pies and a can of Coke. Two warm pies, and, and it's crucial. There's a bit of science in this. You have to have your pies uh, at the right temperature. Too hot and you'll scald yourself. I've done mm. that in practice. Mm. Uh, too cold and that, that meat they and that gravy up. won't be gelatinous enough mm. to uh, get a slide. So there's a real good – there's a real prime temp. And turning the pies up upside down was crucial. And – Sculling a fair bit of your coke and then leaving a little bit because you get to slow down and you get and then you can bang that coke and away you go. So there you go. Skills. What, what sauce? No sauce. No sauce. 
think sourced that had lubrication. Source mm. source wood, but uh, but there was no source. And, Is that and a technicality you, or self inflicted? Oh, wood? I don't think anyone bought source into it. But yeah, it would it would have been good to have a bit of source. Don't worry about that. Now I'd like to hear from you, Dylan, with the exact same enthusiasm as that as to how much detail you put into your lures because I feel like his story's got a lot of detail. And I right. want to try and get that out of a lure. But now we'll, we'll get we'll rip into the lures in a second. I want to know. We better circle back to actually something we should talk about tonight on the fishing side of things. And you said there's like 10,000 lures or whatever up at after whatever it was called. Yeah. Um, what, what, like, how different can they be? And I'll, I'll preface this with I'm a horrible fisher person, fisherman. So, well, you, go, you want to go first or? No, yeah, yeah, I want him to go and talk yeah, about yeah. How, how different they are and then why his are different. Well, like, I suppose when you look at it and you look at the people that like go over to America and fish all these bass comps and like people that fish all the Australian brim tournaments and bass tournaments and stuff like that around Australia, like they, they do it that much that they notice like the slightest little difference, like whether it's just a slight change in color or a slight weight of how slow that lure sinks or how fast it sinks. Like, you know, like you'll go there and you'll have everything and it'll have, you know, 10 colors and then it'll have a size this big and then it'll be this big and then it'll be this big and it'll be this big. But I mean, when you look at the grand scheme of it, you've got like Australia, we've got such a wide range of fishing. Like you go to, you've got Tasmania where you can catch, you know, you got trout, you got brim, and then you got on the east coast you've got tuna, and then you go up more to your like Great Barrier Reef and stuff like that. You've got huge GT, which is all surface lures and stuff like that. And then you go in more, you've got barramundi, and like there's just that much variety in Australia that we just get absolutely pumped out lures. And the thing is, most people like, say you live in Victoria, you know, they probably, you know, they do a bit of Murray cod fishing, but then they also, like, chase snapper or chase squid in your, um, I'm having a mind blank, I've completely forgot what the harbour in there is called. Um, but, What's like, that? in in Melbourne, in Victoria there. Port Phillip Bay. Yeah. Port but Phillip like, Bay or Mallacoota. Yeah, yeah. But, mm-hmm. like, this it's just... The fact that there is so much fishing experiences crammed into Australia, I think that's why we just get absolutely hammered and there's so many different types of lures. And, like, it's funny, like, you look at, like, a certain lure that they've created and they've thought of they want to catch a certain fish in Northern Territory and they won't even, like, know that trout get that big in Tasmania and I'll pick it up and the first thing I'll think is, oh, I want, like, I want to fish that for trout. So it's just so much in colours and everything. It's just, yeah. It's With just, like, I want to rewind a little bit into the science yeah. of a lure, and yep. essentially, you're imitating a wounded fish or a wounded target bait fish yep. for the fish that you're targeting. Yep. Essentially, correct. Yep. So when you're changing colours and things. The colours these things are coming out are in colours that that bait fish is never in. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. There's so a lot is of that there's a, yeah, to there's do a with the eyesight and things in in fish and. Well, there's vagaries around um, what you're trying to do. So you, you can do wounded bait fish, or you can do bait fish that are scared or skittered, and so there'll be different actions. So if you get a lure that's doing a um, big shimmer like that, that's for your species like yellowtail kingfish and salmon that really will or or Spanish mackerel that are like the the dogs at the greyhound races. It doesn't matter what they see, they're going to chase it. Like I'm mm-hmm. sure the dog knows that it's a ball of fluff, but something in his brain goes, oh, I'm going to chase that, mm-hmm. so off they go. So a shimmer will attract those fish. The fish like Murray cod and some of those uh, species that sit down in the home, you're trying to annoy those fish. So that's why the Murray cod lures got big bibs. They mm-hmm. sit up and they got a slow waddle and they stay in, in the zone a lot longer. So they're, they're striking out of basically being annoyed. Uh, not They can f- strike from hunger, but also territorial as well. And there's a lot of fish that are like that. Um, and Dylan mentioned brim. Like you can have one brim-coloured lure 
but it can be a deep diver or a shallow diver and it can be a suspending, a floating or a sinking because those brim, when you throw to them, you can give them a rip, rip, so they come down and then you give them a waggle and then you relax on them and brim will hit a lure when it's suspended. And so then you've got to work out, does your lure float and suspend in brackish water or fresh water or salt water? And so there is a lot of science that goes into it. Um, Berkeley, uh, that do a predominantly soft plastics, so also hard bodies, but that's soft. They have a laboratory in America that's um, probably six or seven acres of fishing laboratory, all to do with scents, uh, material, colours. Now, for mine, the colours is more about the angler. There are certain colours that definitely will trigger a fish, but there's a lot, lot to do with uh, packaging and also colour to do with angler because we, we have a bit of a thing. Some There's a sliding scale of matching the hatch and then what the hell. And so when I talk about matching the hatch, the, the fly fishermen spend a lot of time and they make some majestic and artistic, um, you know. Extremely very, realistic. Oh, very realistic uh, insects, and that's matching the hatch. And we do a bit of match the hatch with some smaller lures and bits and pieces, but then those same trout, we fish for them with these things called fish cakes, which are principally just big bits of broom handle. I used to make them as a kid. You cut the end off mum's... Um, broom handle. Broom handles were knocked about when I was a kid because if you weren't making monkey magic nunchuck sticks, you were making fish cakes. And then you put like a little propeller on them and you paint them up the silliest of colours and you throw them and you just roll them slowly and the little propeller goes bop, 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 bop. They've got trebles hanging off them everywhere. And that represents nothing that flies mm. in Tasmania or, or in the bottom of um, New South Wales or Victoria, yet they catch fish. It's, it's really quite crazy. So it's basically um, open to your imagination and then it's up to the manufacturer to catch fish on them and prove them. And then it's up to me to use them uselessly. Like you could give me the best lure for the best situation and you could be right next to me, but if I don't work it right or present it right or – and I do uh, follow a few guys, Aussie fly fish and um, haul fly fishing and things, and they do a lot of stuff up northern uh, North Australia – and there's like surface fishing for these things and you can see like they've got good footage and that, you know, oh, we didn't present that one right or, oh, we moved that one wrong and just the fish ignored it and went the other way. But it's that's in clear water so you can see what they're oh, doing. Oh, yeah, very much so. But if, you, if you're new to fishing, pick a species that basically, you know, suicides at the side of a lure and that will um, give you some good confidence to then start picking those fish that are tricky. Like certain times of the year, trout will attack pretty much anything. Sometimes the year in that clean what they call gin clear water, they're very, very tricky. Um, but, I mean, Australian salmon, if you get them in a little bit of moving water, as long as you turn and burn, what we call a turn and burn, throw a halco slice, rip it through where you think they are and you, you'll get some fish in it, and that'll excite you for the next stage. Um, nothing worse than going to the bank of a river and just cast, 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 which I did the other day, mind you, um, and didn't didn't turn a handle on a fish. That's that's miserable. But that that's that you, lure I said. error, though. Oh, no, it's, the lure was rubbish. I mentioned it to Dylan. I, I kept it. It had no action. It was like a stick coming through the water. It was rubbish. Were you testing? Is that something? No, it was, just some, it was just some – we were just doing a video for the podcast <laughs> yeah. announcing some giveaway, and I was, just, I was just throwing this lure and I was doing it to camera and I noticed – I'm just watching this lure going, well, I am doing a video, but I wouldn't mind catching a fish and go, oh. <laughs> that would make but a good video. There was – it was just rubbish, and that's the difference between <laughs> – Sometimes a, I'm sure that lure was off Timu or wouldn't have been Timu, but it would have been eBay back in the day. Yeah. It was just a rubbish lure. Yeah. Looked Wish. a million bucks, looked a million bucks, but it just wasn't doing it. My father-in-law bought a, I don't know, 150 mil long segregated hard body thing with a couple of hooks hanging off it and it, you know, was electric. So you charge it up and it caught nothing except seaweed. It was just good fun to <laughs> For the kids to play with and get that's an on. interesting concept though and i think that concept will come a lot more and I, I i got laughed at about six seven years ago at a conference and i called it micro machination i basically invented the term on the spot but i just had you, you, you know you get these little green things that are like an ant or a little bit of a cockroach sort of thing and they've got a little solar powered thing and they've got a little motor on them and they out of whack vibrate the kids mm. you might not have seen them but you put them out in the sun and they're little cockroachy things and they the sun makes the little motor go and they're an out-of-whack sort of a thing and, and they vibrate. And I was watching that going, 
if you could somehow get a fish and law to, and I've seen those one that you you're talking about. I've seen them, and they're a little bit big and a little bit yeah, sort clunky. of yeah. yeah, but when they when they get that technology, uh, and you can throw a law and be connected with it and maintain some connection, but something's I've seen them swim, and they look like they're going to get eaten big. Mm. And I mean, they actually make uh, Murray cod laws that look like uh, baby glass that have fallen out the nest. I, I've actually seen them. So there's a just a wide range of yep. people's ideas. Of I've got a blue what, tongue, blue tongue lizard lure. Yeah, I'm not sure you catch too many fish on, but they look wicked. And they, it makes yeah. sense if there's in the Murray River, there's a lot of trees with galah nests, and one falls out. I've got no doubt in my mind a Murray cod will eat a dead baby galah because I've seen firsthand mm-hmm. um, southern bluefin tuna that have eaten cormorants, and these were 120 kilo tuna, and they've eaten cormorants and those little Jesus birds, I call them, they skip on the surface of the water, they walk on the water, they're only tiny. And there was three or four of those in, in its stomach contents when they when they um, harvested that fish. So it's yeah, well. surprising what they'll eat. What's your, uh, what's your favourite fish to catch, Dill? Trout? Trout, tr- trout's the obvious or the, because... Or, or does it get a bit easy now? Oh, well, like, yes and no, but, the like, the one thing about trout fishing in Tasmania is you've got so much variety in Tasmania, like the west coast of Tasmania is like a rainforest. Like it is ridiculous. It rains three hundred odd days a year there. Um the Highland Lakes just literally just full of rocks and it looks like it hasn't been rained on in about three hundred days. And then you've got like rivers and stuff like that. So like trout is always something that's been, you know, relatively close to home that I've done for a long time but other than trout i'd definitely say kingfish is the next thing that puts the like a good amount of thrill through me because they're something that i'm currently you know just starting to work out like because in tassie they only come down here for a couple of months and they're more sort of like obviously seasonal but um yeah, that's probably the next thing that I want to develop some time into and sort of get a bit more of an idea on. But if I had to say one, it would be probably trout since I've just done it for so long. Fly fishing as well? No. Nah. Nah. I, I I don't know. Like I, I, A lot of people, like, when they start lure fishing, then they go into fly fishing. And, like, I went through that. But it's sort of, it's hard, like, to want to, like, put down, like, when you fish lures for so long, it's hard to want to pick up a fly rod and cast and cast while you're like, oh, that looks so good. Like, if I just picked up a lure and threw it in there, you know, I'd probably catch a fish. So, I don't know. Like, I had never really picked it, picked it up and went with it, but... Like, I mean, it's obviously been around for ages and it catches fish and, you know, some people love it. Some people love to stir at people that do it. So, and I'm one of them at the moment. I feel it's a little bit like the archery side of, of hunting. You're, you're prepared, you're going into it prepared and knowing that you're not going to be as successful as you would be with a rifle. But, man, when you get one, like, yeah. Yeah. It, it, pay, it feels better. It yeah. You know, yeah. it's a little bit more enjoyable because you've had to work mm-hmm. harder for it. But at my point in life, and you're probably the same, to me, success is having something to show for it, not yeah. necessarily just having a good time. Yeah. Uh, like we have a good time too, but if you come home without fish, you're like, ah, oh, I didn't really have a good day, didn't catch anything. Whereas a fly fisherman, you know, who comes home with an empty bag and no fish, he's still smiling. Yeah. It just yeah. seems to be at that point of his life where he's okay to – which um, that's like that's like a funny yes. thing to mention too, with like obviously you do social media for your hunting side of it, <laughs> I do social media for the fishing side of it. It's like it's very interesting because it's like you know before you even really did it, you just you know you'd go fishing and you're just happy to get out. But then it's like you don't put pressure on yourself, but you're like oh god mm-hmm. like. If I could catch a good fish, I know I'll get a good video. Oh, if I could catch a good fish, I know I'll get good photos. And like, it's funny. It, content, it tricks content, with your content. mind. And it's like, for some people, I feel like that would definitely ruin it. But I feel it's the complete opposite for me. It like, it makes me want to go, you know, further and further and further. And 
push harder and harder and harder because it's like for me you know going out and catching fish is all about sharing it to people online because like so what i'm 20 i've been doing the youtube side of it since i was 14 that is for me what fishing is like i haven't gone fishing by myself and not thought about oh i'd like to try and get a video from it so yeah it's interesting how it plays with social media and stuff like that but yeah well Hooch just said it before you know he was playing with a lure and taking a video it would have been nice if i caught a fish while i was doing it yeah it's just it adds to the situation of the video um obviously you know but if you look at someone's Instagram feed and they're a fishing guide or whatever, and you're just looking at pictures of sunsets and scenery and rivers and rocks, it's not very interesting. Yeah, you don't go you fishing want, with them. <laughs> you know, fish. You want yeah. You want fish. That's that's what you're looking for. It's uh, our local hunting club, and I know they're all listening. Uh, we just had our AGM the other night, and they put up their little bios of you know the president and everything. And there's five pictures went up, and three of them have got dead animals, and two of them have got sunsets. And I said, oh, you can you can tell who the hunters are. Oh, what did I say? The um, who the Successful. killers are, and the other two are just into painkillers. <laughs> it's interesting though the point you raise. So I've I've seen some people do it quite well, where they they tell the story of the trip, but they're happy to celebrate their donuts. Like in the fishing world, we call them donut days. Yeah. Got a big zero. Um, so Steve Starling, he he did a he did a video, and I think he got a sense of that, that he wasn't going to go and he do it good. So he shaped that video as a donut day, and and that sort of resonated a little bit because because everyone it, has it. Well, it, it ruins everyone if you think you, you watch. Um, I know there's some people on our, our local uh, social media in and around Tasmania, and they're, they're followed by people here and also on the mainland. And they're always holding fish and, oh, I've done this trip, but you just don't see. I know personally, particularly with snapper, they might have done in a month four um, social media posts, but they've gone fishing 20 nights in that in that month, risked, risked uh, divorce, yeah. cost them a fortune, and people just think, oh, they catch fish every time they go. It's just not the yeah. case. And, and it was once we went, um, we were in Port Stephens once, and myself and the man in this other uh, painting here, he's passed away now, but we, we're in Port Stephens and, and um, Michael Guest, who has a fishing show, he asked us to go out with him. They had a couple of cricketers. One of them was uh, Harmington or someone who was an English, I don't know who he was, but an English, he was an English fast bowler. We went out and had a great day. We had some good vision. We got some fish jumping. We hooked some fish, but because we didn't land one, he wasn't prepared to show it and I just thought that and that was like five years ago I thought, that's a bit of a shame because you should say to people you don't always have success when you do these things you spend your money you spend your time you back yourself but not every time it's like with hunting as well the amount of times I've gone fellow deer shooting and come out with nothing and ridiculed by mates and and partners at the time and mum and dad where's my venison, my venison roast it's um yeah you just would stop doing it but you, you don't. You just keep going. So I think I think sometimes it's the onus is on some of these social media people to to have an occasional donut day video or, or have a video where you know I, I missed or I trod on a stick or I've actually watched that meat eater show and he had a couple of really bad misses mm-hmm. um, and I thought that was relevant. I thought yeah. that was quite quite was just, resonated with me. I was just going to bring that up. He's probably one of well, I mean, he's the most watched one. So I want to say that. The most recent one that's done donut episodes uh, well, and he's not afraid to show that he messes up or whatnot. I mean, there's he's lost animals, wounded them, and things. It happens. It, mm. it happens. You're not going to make a show out of it, but he's at not a point. Every time. He, not every well, no, time. He's also at a point. I don't know if you know much background about him. He has. He doesn't need sponsors. He is his own massive thing. So of when course. you're in the you know delicate stages of fledgling onlineness mm, yeah. you can't afford to be seen to be doing those things because you've got to protect the image and protect the brand and and your sponsors and things like that but he you know, he doesn't care if he puts a show out and he wounded an animal and you know it happens it definitely happens if yeah i say to people if you don't you know if you haven't wounded an animal and lost it you haven't shot enough animals yeah, and I mean, he does it the right way too. He shows the effort that he puts in, and that 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 is like a stewardship because some people might wound an animal and spend 10 minutes and go, oh, no, she's all too hard, but that's not the way we should 
uh, go about our business as hunters. And, and he shows a really good amount of stewardship in, in putting in as much effort. And I mean, if he, if he loses an animal, it's, 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 um, you know, it, it may even go on to survive. It's either not lost enough blood or he hasn't hit it in the right spot. Who knows? It could go off and die and end up a carcass in the bush. Um, but he does it the right way. I think he, he shows that you've got to put a lot of effort into it. And, and when he, um, you know, does eventually find that animal, dispatches it cleanly, and then sets about maximising that meat recovery. So I think he does a fantastic job. I was going to ask this question later, but we're on the topic now, so I'll, I'll head into it and then we'll circle back to trout because I've got uh, – I started – I've got a thing <laughs> on my website where you can write in and send a question and, uh, you know, people send in questions and then I read them out on air and if they get read on air, they get a hat and at the end of the year – they uh, go in the draw to win a hunt with with me. Anyway, oh, so nice. I've got some questions to get to, and they're trout related because uh, they knew you were coming on. But talking about wounding animals now, it's a it's an awkward question. Uh, I don't want I don't I want think people. I know where you're going here. Can I answer the question? I, we'll come back to this, but can okay. I answer my fish? You were going to ask what fish I like to catch. Yeah, I am a meat eater. I'm a fisher that likes to put stuff in my esky. Everyone says, "Oh, you into fitness? Yeah, fitness into my esky." Yeah. But but my fish that I love to catch are mako shark and marlin because they are an adrenaline fish. Mm-hmm. Now the mako shark, if it's a big one, we will release it. If it's because it could be a breeding female, or whatever. It's a smaller one, we'll harvest it. But a lot of people um, do the same thing. Marlin predominantly tag and release, and I think that's where you're about to go. Are you the yeah. the ideology around no nah, well no not, not particularly catch and release no. my, yep. my my question is i think that hunters meaning uh shooters archers are more um i've been trying to work out how to word this for the last couple of days uh ethically more humane towards animals than fishermen and it is a bugbear of mine that Fishing is so widely accepted and hunting is not. But if you actually look at what's happening to the animals, hunting is much more humane from a, and I, I want to say live bait type thing, but even just chucking a fish back in after dragging it. It's the equivalent of us using, you know, wounding a goat, tying it to a tree to catch a lion yes. or something. Um, yeah, sort of. if, if we use that, you know, analogy of what's happening yeah. in the fish world onto, and I know there's the whole pain receptor type things and I'm happy I'm not scientifically versed on that. So please rip into me if I'm, and I, and I also don't want this question to see, like I love fishing and I've used live bait and so I'm not saying I'm better than anyone else. I just want to know what your thoughts are on it. Cause it's a crappy topic, but no, no, I, it's I'm, a good glad, topic. I'm glad the greenies yeah. don't, uh, dwell on it too much because, you know, they're already working on bow hunting, so it won't be far until they're chasing yeah. you guys now. I don't see it as a, a crappy topic. I, I see it as a very relevant topic. And and there's a lot of um, interesting vagrancies amongst that as well and, and some some conflict as well because it comes down to that pain receptor stuff and it come, and also comes down to that um, conversation in Pulp Fiction where Samuel L. Jackson and um, John Travolta are going on about um, the difference between a dog and a pig, you know. Mm-hmm. Like it's a little bit like that because they're saying, oh, because I should explain it better. Like a fish, I've caught plenty of fish, right, and I've harvested plenty of fish and I've never, ever had the same feelings internally as when I've shot my first fallow deer Mm -hmm. and continue to shoot fallow deer. Like when you shoot those animals, you pay them a lot more respect and it, it gets you a bit weird. It's hard to explain. But that's it's, your emotions, not theirs. That's, that is, yes, true. But you get some hunters that just blaze away and just drop 20 fellow and don't really uh, matter about it. So it's it, there's a lot of vagrancies around um, who does the shooting and what. The, and you say that hunters are more humane than the fishers. Well, I would say that across the fishers and the hunters, the demographic is the same. You've got people that in the fishing world which will wet their hands, get the fish, icky spike it. Why you wet your hands before you icky spike it, I don't know because you, you're killing it anyway. But if you're releasing fish, wet your hands most definitely. Um, but but more and more there is a there is a propensity to icky spike your fish, even squid. Like 
squid are basically blowflies of the ocean, um, but people are going out of their way to, you know, net them gently, put them on the thing and icky spike them all. There's a little bit of a technique where you can give them a bit of a chop suey and they all go white. They're instantly dead. What's, um, a, what's an icky spike? Icky spike is a Japanese term for a particular special spike and there's a certain spot to spike a fish in its brain. Um, it's very popular with snapper. It's very popular with all eating eating fish because it relaxes those fish and it starts uh, the process of, of um, rigor mortis, I suppose, for want of a better term. As soon as you kill them, uh, the quicker they go, the qu- more humanely that they're killed and they're going to go through that rigor mortis process. People don't sort of realise, and I'm sure your, your listeners would, that, that you know, meat is better when it ca- is on the other side of that uh, yeah, rigor, relaxing, rigor relaxing. That's exactly right. Um, but I mean, back in the day, you, you're, you're exactly right. You've probably experienced people that go and catch a heap of fish and they throw them on the deck and they're flip flapping around. You know, they're basically suffocating. Terrible. We all did it. Um, we all did it. Some still do it. But that's all part of the um, stewardship of teaching people that you can do it. And I'm not. I don't tell people it's right or wrong. I, I tell people well, this is the way you do it nowadays because of this, this, and this. They can take those learnings and chuck them in the bin or they can go, you know what, that's a fair point. Maybe when I catch a fish, I either – and with tuna, for example, there's a program um, that's massively successful called Tuna Champion. So in the past, you catch a tuna, bluefin tuna, dump it on the deck, just lays on the deck all day, flapping away, probably dies very slowly. Nowadays – much different. We, we've got the process where you have got the little knife where you get them on board, um, you can icky spike them, icky jimmy is the full term, and then you get your little knife and just behind the um, fin you, you snick them. It only has to be that four mil, five mil, uh, just behind the pectoral fin and they bleed out absolutely sensationally um, and then you can put them in an ice slurry and you've got the maximum amount of flesh uh, that's good to harvest. And there's all sorts of videos on how to harvest those um, fish to get the best return, as I've seen with a lot of deer um, and a lot of game. It's it's an ever-increasing thing because we're coming under the microscope and we have to be able to say, well, no, nah, hang on. Well, that's fair that you've got that opinion, but then share what we're doing. And, then, again, they, they can take that information and do what they want with it. Some of What them, about live baiting? Live baiting is an interesting one and, and, and it's come from, you know, where do you go? Like you've got worms, frogs. Frogs have been banned. I get it. And, and this comes back to the Pulp Fiction thing. Worm, no one gets two poos about. But a frog, that's a cute animal. So that's the Pulp Fiction thing. Um, and so the cuter the animal, the more people feel about it. Um, some of these fish that we use as live, live baits are very readily available. They're in massive numbers, like a potty mullet. Like a potty mullet is um, a great live bait. Um, little, little, um, little tiny um, juvenile Australian salmon, they make great um, live baits. It's just part of the process. Um, and, and it's just a little bit like attitudes change. There, there may well be a time when we're not allowed to live bait. In the same way, um, people used to go to the Northern Territory and the list would be pigs, buffalo, and believe it or not, wedgetail eagles. Now, when's the last time that someone came back saying they just shot a trophy wedgetail eagle? Mm. For a long, long time. So, so that transition of people's attitudes may come um, and it just depends on how well we stick up for our... Uh, rights and how much science we use because we can't operate on a belief system. I believe it's fine. Well, if it's actually scientifically proven that that animal is suffering to that degree, but if science can prove that it's not, then live baiting is fine for me. And at the minute, fish uh, fish are a animal that science has, science has said that the pain receptors are far different. And so the analogy, while it was a good one, uh, of the lamb tied to the state enticing a line is a live bait situation probably a little bit different than what's going on out there in the ocean what about you dylan as a lure man are you a do you use much oh, bait live bait oh uh, like not really like not really any live bait like for fresh water like i'm all all lures like very early season i might do a little bit with worms and stuff like that but like like Trout wise, basically, like it'd be ninety nine point nine percent of my fishing is with lures. Like, I don't know. Like, I know mm. everyone's gonna have their own specific opinion, but I believe as long as you know you are doing the best that you possibly can. So, like, say you're gonna release fish, 
you know, you wet your hands, you like leave it in the water, then you like quickly get up, get a photo, then put it back in, like give the fish time to actually properly revive. You know, you're not just like, oh yeah, there it is, and then like throw it away straight away. Like as long as you're trying to do the best that you can, I mean, like that's at the end of the day, that's all we can really do. Like try to do the best that we can for, you know, the sport that we love. I had this conversation with the fly fish show and the it was the first fur versus fin conversation. Um and oh, I can't remember where I was gonna go with that. No, I forgot my train of thought. But oh we we're talking about um catch and release and and the comment was even if we release a fish that's had a hook in it, you can never release a deer you've shot. You know, like, you know, we might release one that's 10% wounded that'll heal over time or we lose a fish and the line snaps and it's got a hook in its mouth and it runs away. I'm, if you answer that question, how long does a hook last in the salt water in a, in a fish? Not long? Uh, it depends on what it's made out of, but even a stainless steel hook will, will disintegrate. Uh, the ocean is a fairly harsh environment. Stainless hook doesn't mean that it's going to last forever. It's just stainless, so rusts less. Uh, but when you find those um, those marlin competitions where they tag a lot of fish, they'll use a high carbon steel or high something steel, and that will rust a little bit. But also in saying that, um, fish are fairly hardy animals. They're they're a fairly basic sort of a species. Um, we've caught fish. Um, that have had, particularly mako sharks, we've caught fish that have got hooks in them that were probably in them for a month or so, and they're just swimming around like it's just some sort of jewellery. It doesn't. It really doesn't worry. doesn't seem like infections an issue either because they're in. No, not at all. And and yeah. um, you know there are some issues around being gut hooked and that sort of thing. And you make the judgment call when when you've got a fish uh, and if it's gut hooked and and you you know and you you know enough about biology of animals to go, oh, that's a bit irresponsible to release that fish and so in game fishing competitions you might some people not us but some people might tag that fish throw it overside knowing full well that that's not going to um be an animal that survives or a fish that survives and they'll write it down on their score but um i would say the lion share and i would hope to say the lion share if people make those really good judgment calls there's a bit of a cool thing going about it's not something i do but people that take a photo when they pull the fish out of the water um they'll hold their breath and so they'll hold their breath, and when they're um, getting discomfort, they'll put the fish back in the water. If they haven't got quite the photo that they want, then they'll go again. I think that's a good idea because I've yep. seen people hold fish out of the water for just a ridiculously long time to get that good photo. Um, so it is coming, but, I mean, I think we are doing a lot of things, both hunters and also fishers, uh, to regulate ourselves, but we must remember that those people that are, you know, Facebook fans of Peter or Peter or whatever they are, and unfortunately, even disturbingly, the RSPCA, um, you, you just won't you won't be able to break bread with those people. They they are completely the wrong side of the discussion. I like to have a moving pendulum and find the middle ground in most situations, but their pendulums are just TIG welded uh, to one side, and you won't move them. Like these people are talking about, you know, shearing you know, banning shearing and, and these sorts of things. It's just you just want you will not break bread with those people. It's pretty outrageous. The uh, the main one that's causing us ripples at the moment is Georgie Purcell. She's um the AJP Animal Justice Party in Victoria. She always wears purple, dresses in purple and that's her favourite colour and whatnot. But yeah, she's uh, stirring up things, especially in the bow hunting. South Australia is just you know, banned bow hunting, effective in December this year. It's just it's dangerous, dangerous path. And just before I keep going on that point specifically, it bugs me and I've been doing a lot of work with this as American non-for-profit organisation called Blood Origins, which are more so in the hunting side of things. But there's a petition going around that, you know, to get it reviewed, it needs a certain amount of signatures. And I can't remember how many it's up to. I want to say five or 6,000. But it's there's a sense that, hey, this is happening in South Australia. I kind of live in Brisbane, you know. I don't see that as an issue that affects me. It's just it's the canary at the end of the tunnel. It's the rose bush at the end of the the vineyard. It it it's going to happen. It's just going to if they can get it to fall there, it'll just keep falling across the states. Once one state proves it can do it, and I, I fear that 
and and my like I hope you don't see my fishing questions as anti questions. They're just you know provoking and stirring ones. But I fear that if they did go down and say, hey, we're going to ban live baiting, and there'd be people in the fishing community, they're like, oh okay, like yeah, I don't live bait. Um, doesn't really affect me specifically, and not fight against it. That's but, this is the thing that and um, it's just a domino. Yeah, it's it's absolutely crazy, and it's a very worrying situation. Um, and like a hark back to the belief system, we we need to have a grounding in um, science. And I know ever since Y two K in two thousand, when every plane was going to fly out, drop out of the sky, it's and before actors, you were born, Dylan. Yeah, <laughs> well before you were born, but. Back, back then, Dylan, they said that when the clock went over from 1999 to 2000, everything was just going to lose its mind. Planes were going to fall out of the sky. Computers were going to be rubbish. Computers were not designed to turn over to 2000. That's what they were telling us. Yeah. And so ever since then and ever since, you know, some stuff in and around COVID, science has gone down a couple of pegs. Um, but science is still science. It's all we've got. Um, and we must but make some pretty science good Science is only correct until another bit of science comes along and proves it wrong. Proves it wrong. True, yeah. but there's and, lots yeah. of checks and balances, lots of checks and balances, and that can't happen just because someone says, I believe. So that's the danger in the, the belief system. I believe. Um, or yeah, it's my I believe. Opinion. Yeah, that's, that's right. But so, um, with, with the hunting stuff, I, I, I think we're in oh, we're the fishing, but I'm a, I am a hunter and a shooter and I love it to death. Um. I think we're our own first, our own worst enemies because all the people, not all the people, that's a broad generalisation, but most of the people that are making a lot of noise, they don't have much else to do and we're out doing stuff. Like we're doers, hunters and gatherers, fishers, we're doers. We're not sitting around looking at the next thing that we can ban because it doesn't sit well with my beliefs mm. and we let them do it. And so they get on Facebook and we, we're not interested in the fight. Some are, but... but but they see it as a waste of time. I think there comes a time when we must stand and say, nah, hang on, woo, we've had a gutful. And the only way that we're going to be able to say that stringently is is some scientific stuff, not necessarily science, but studies to prove otherwise. Because I see a lot of these um, a lot of these wilderness society and a lot of these environmental things, they jump up, they pop out of anywhere, and they've got like Facebook followers of 2,000, all of a sudden they're 10,000 strong and what they put on their pages is shaped and it's diatribe and a lot of it is not just shaped, it's mis, it's just not fat. Mm. Uh, we see it a great deal and then all of a sudden they've got the hearts and minds of all the people in the cities. You look at the population, where everyone mm. lives, um, as soon as those people that know nothing of our lifestyle or, or, our, or the way we've grown up or our grandfather's lifestyles they just just tick a box and go yep i believe that's wrong and don't go they don't even want to ask about the history of it or the intent or how we go about it it's just a blatant wrong and that signature thing is ridiculous it's so dangerous they don't care they just sign it and off it goes i've got ten thousand. well it doesn't carry any weight with me um and it's disappointing that it carries any weight well, no, the, the signature thing is actually us trying to get signatures because once it gets above a certain point, it actually has to be presented to Parliament. Like they have to ignore it or they ignore it until it gets to a certain level of signatures, then it has to be talked about, like it can't be avoided. So that, that's what we're trying to achieve. Ah, uh, um, now but, you, but what sorry, I'll say about that. The, yeah, but anyone that, can start that's a petition a system, and you yes, walk around right. and you're like, do you want to, you know, save starving children in Africa? And then everyone will sign that, of course, yeah. but... What you're doing is signing something that's got a little bit to do with that and a lot of it to do with other things, but that's that's what they use it for. With um... The biggest thing we can do as hunters and fishers and people that are of the country and a bit more rural is pay more attention to politics. And I know that is like a cross to a vampire uh, or garlic to a vampire, but we must, we must get people in the positions that support us. That's what government's all about. And we just we just ignore it until it's a problem and then we grizzle about it at the end. But if we don't put people in roles that are in positions of power to say, nah, hang on, woo, then we're wasting our time. You might as well go to the gun cupboard right now, unlock it and toss your guns out mm. um, or toss your fishing rods out. Because if we don't Get in, and even if it means um, local government, if it means um, your state government and federal government, we must have a voice. And at the moment, our voice is watered down horribly. Everyone's swinging 
and I'm not a I'm not a card carrying loony Nazi. I, I'm the middle, but the pendulum has swung so far the other way that we all, all the people that are the middle are labelled as you know card carrying clansmen. And, and it's just it's just wrong. It's very disappointing. You said before that you know hunters are our own worst enemy and things. Do you do you see it, Dylan, especially online with your presence? That uh, and I want to just focus on Tasmania. The different factions of the fishing community bicker, or or is there like a communal support? Because we we get it. We get uh, you know bow hunting versus rifle hunting, dog hunting. It, everyone's like, oh, I don't like them because they do this, and I don't like. And then instead of a you know, jump around each other and lift everyone up together. Oh, uh, like I, I don't think so. Like I don't think it's as bad as like that sounds. Like I think relatively everyone in fishing communities, you know, relatively, you know, supporting because like that's a thing where like say you you know you go hunting and you know you only use rifles or you only use bows or something. That's sort of you know that's sort of you where like. A lot of people in Tasmania, you know, like they'll throughout summer they'll fish for salt water because it's warmer, and then trout season will open, or it'll you know the weather will get colder, and they'll go trout fishing, and it's like so most, I think there's a higher number of people that are touching yeah, all like of the most, factions instead like of rec- recently. Communities. Recently, in our um, podcast that we've just started, like so August is the start of trout season in Tasmania, like. We have just had reports after reports after reports on trout where it's like as soon as it gets to summer, like trout are a cold water, like they move a lot, they're a lot more active in cold water. Like as soon as it gets to summer, it'll just be the complete opposite way. It'll just be salt water, salt water, salt water, salt water. So I think And you think those reports will be coming from the same people? Yeah, like I I think it's contradicts. Yeah. Like, I think in the fishing sort of industry, it sort of your question sort of contradicts itself in the sense that people, like, yeah, they go fishing, but, like, they do everything because it's like, you know, for instance, say you, like, you go hunting in, like, New South Wales or something, and I don't know enough about hunting that I'm just going to use a broad spectrum. And you I'm see just that. waiting for this analogy. And, and you see the hunting in Northern Territory and you think, that's sick. Like, I want to do that. But, you know, you, so you wait and you wait and you wait and, you, and then you finally, you know, you get the money or whatever and you go and do it. It's the same thing here. It's like, you know, you're sitting here and you're like, you see photos of tuna and stuff like that and you're like, what am I going trout fishing for? I'm going to go chase tuna because Tassie's so small. It's like... I'm two hours from the east coast where I can go chase tuna and I'm two hours from the west coast where I can go chase, you know, huge trout. Like, it's small enough that, like, if you see a photo of a fish in Tasmania, you can drive three hours and get to it and fish it in the weekend that I think people just genuinely do, you know, everything in Tassie that they can. One of the main reasons I ask is I've got one mate who just – all he uses is bait casters, and I just I think the worst thing about owning a bait caster is telling your parents that you're gay, and I just <laughs> I can't I can't support him in his fishing journey because I can't you, work out how to use the damn things. Where do you live? Uh, uh, south of Sydney. Oh, I think you've just ostracised most of the <laughs> south of not the city in the. Uh, lucky I don't roll in the in the fishing circles. No, look, it was a light. It was a lighthearted joke. But. Oh, I know that, and so I'm the same too. Um, bait casters to me, like in Tassie, we're all we're all egg beaters. Um, bait casters are just a complexity that we don't really. In, in saying that, I just learn. used one up in Darwin, and it like it never got tangled, and I had no idea what I was doing. So, it was well, they've a, got a lot a, of te- uh, technology now. They've actually got magnets in them that you can. I think they've had it for a while, but not the ones I've been buying. And you can really regulate that overspool. So oh, well, that's what this guy they, said. He said, "Don't touch the things on the side, please." So yeah, that's my yeah, don't touch it. That's he's probably got it tuned. And what you do is you hold it up and then you trip it, and if it falls down real uh, quick. But if you've got a newbie, when you click the release button, you want it to fall down really, really slow. But if you've got someone who's got a few um, skills, it, it'll it'll drop down a bit a bit quicker. But if it free spools down, that's bad. That's bad news. But I think you've hit the nail on the head, Dylan. Um, a lot of people in Tassie do do. Uh, everything, but there are some areas like the the, the game fishermen. They've got big egos, um, you know. They've got big boats. They're all trying to outdo each other in what what 
extra kit they've got on their um, their 300 series. Um, oh, you've got a patrol, you're a mess. Oh, you've only got a seven metre boat, we've got an eight and a half metre boat. So there's all that sort of stuff. But that's the same in life. I'm sure yeah. it's the same with most sports. And then the brim fishermen, well, they're a breed under their own. Yeah. Um, they're quite interesting units, the brim, the brim fishermen. The trout guys, they're all um, – and there's all crossovers. It's like everything. Yeah. Um, the trout fishers, they're all they're all sold to the earth. Um, they do a bit of brim fishing. They do a bit of estuary mm. fishing. Um, the game fishermen love going fishing for trout. So, yeah, it's a pretty good mix. Um, but there yeah. are some some little niggles that people you know, wanna, like to do. I want to get back to this question in a second. But early on, Dylan, you mentioned um, bass and – I just I've watched watched a bit of American things, but yeah. they had the lure over there where it's like a, a series of attractants, and then like all it looked like a I don't know fishing basket on the side, uh, not yeah. fishing a um, clothesline oh, basket. Oh, the spinner baits. Mm. They're a spinner bait thing with either. Yeah. It's huge, and it's got heaps yeah. of heaps of attractants and things, yeah. and they got banned in most of their competitions and things over I, there because they were I, so effective. I know, I know exactly what you're. Oh, I can't, but. Yeah, like I know exactly what you're talking about. Well, so my question is, is it legal here? I no, not legal here, I wouldn't think. Well, they're like a mini teaser. So yeah. with marlin, you've got that big thing, crossovers, and you've got all these little tinsel fish. It's just like a mi- mini version of that. I wouldn't well, well, think. So now we're seeing, uh, now we see videos, because like, they've got the camera hooked up to the teasers, and you can see the, the fish playing with the, you know. Yeah, they come in and they slap them yeah. um, and, and try and eat them. Dylan's oh. off there trying to trying I'm to trying find it. I'm trying to find it. Well, uh, I'll ask. No, that's all right. You do some background there, Dylan, our producer. I'm keen you... to hear what calibers you're rocking in your, your gun uh, well, safe dodge. I've got it sitting here right next to Hang me. Hang on. Um, first of all, how many guns have you got in your gun safe? So, so I'll, I'll answer that with this story, and I don't know if okay. I told this on air. It was at a uh, shot show in Sydney. and How long it, ago? I might have had that one. Channel 7. Oh, early days. I actually did oh. the skinning and dem- uh, skinning and butchery demos at most of the shot shows. Up, so I did uh, Sydney, Brisbane, Melbourne, Perth, and oh, nice. Um, where's the other one? Auckland. We went over there one year. Uh, so I've been at I've been at a lot of them for a lot of years. But um, I was working on a booth, Eagle Eye Hunting Gear Channel Seven. were poking around, trying to. Um, they they sell max boxes and and a few other shooting rests, but. Channel Seven were poking stories, you know, like trying to trying to. I wouldn't say get a positive story out of everyone. They were trying to get a negative spin out of the show. Yeah. And the interviewer came up and she said, "You know, I'm such and such from such and such, and your name." Da, da, da. This was off camera. She said, "I just want to ask you how many guns you've got." And I said, "Oh, I've got nine. And she just went, "Click, click, <laughs> get the camera, bring it over." And uh, anyway, they set up and they said, yeah, I'm here at the SSWA Shot Show in Sydney and I'm here with Dodge and uh, I've just got a question for you, Dodge, you know, uh, what do you think of the show and whatnot and uh, how many guns do you have? I said, I've got nine. She goes, and why do you need nine guns? And I just looked at the cameraman, like above his camera, and I said, do you play golf, mate? And he nodded. And I said, do you just use a putter? <laughs> or do That's you use gold. a driver or a wedge? <laughs> anyway, she just went, cut and then they walked away and there was no yeah. story i never made it to yeah. tv oh, that's a good, no, i'll tell you what that's a good response i've never never actually thought about and that i'd heard it somewhere else that i'll claim you it hit the nail on the head but um, same thing with fishing it, rods like everyone's got 200 of them well, well i don't i got two and neither of them work i reckon they're broken um I, i've i've actually i've got a missing section in the middle of my caliber range but i've got a couple of 22s 22 magnum uh i've got a 17 hmr it's not mine but it's in there from a mate and then I go up to 223, uh, I've got a 260, a 270, and then I go, I've go. i got a real old school 308, open sight Spanish Mauser thing. Oh, nice. It's good fun. Um, and then I go 306, um, 375, 416. So I don't know how many that is, but I think there's – oh, and i got a, an air rifle and shotgun. Yeah, two right. got too many gaps there. Where was your gap? Two sh- well, th- yeah, technicality. The two sixty is my wife, so she won't let me use it for deer hunting. Ah. Um, so I've got two, two, three, and I don't technically own the thirty oh six anymore. It's still here, but it's not mine. Sold it, um, and I've got the open sights three oh eight, which I don't use for deer hunting. And I just bought the two seventy not long ago and haven't put a scope on it. So my hole in the middle is I shoot. Deer with big guns or little guns. I either shoot yes. my fellow with a two two three, 
yep. or a four sixteen because it's really good fun. Yeah, two two three is fine, but illegal in Tassie. Illegal um, is it? Yeah, not not allowed to have a two two three. Two four three is the smallest. Not allowed to have. Tassie. Or not allowed to use. Uh, on not fallow. allowed to shoot fallow deer. So right, two so, four three is the minimum calorie. Yeah, so Tassie. so we have uh, in New South Wales they're called recommended minimums, and oh. very early on in my, you know, like just got my firearms license, I went and attended a deer hunting seminar, and he popped up with that. It was Andy Mallon. We're friends now. I'll get him on the show here in a couple of yep. months' time. But he said on stage, he goes, "Yeah, it's the recommended minimum two two three. Ah, sorry, two four three. Yep. And and I said, "Oh, I've only got a two two three. Does that mean I can't shoot deer?" And he said that a well placed two two three shot is so much better than a poorly placed, you know, three oh eight shot. So he yep. said, if you've got a two two three and you know how to shoot it properly, that's fine. But yep. understand that if you shoot it poorly, you'll wound an animal to run away. Yeah, so I do a lot of neck shots, uh, high shoulder shots with that. I've shot them in the chest before and they haven't gone too far, but yeah. I've no, also lost, lost some. It's a valid point you make. I've, I've been in and out of calibers a little bit. I, I'm not, I've never been a, 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 a shooting or hunting tragic, but I'm from Tasmania and I live in a country I love hunting and shooting. So I've copped a fair bit of flack over the years because the first ever, uh, when I was about 19 or 21, 19, 21, I, the boys and this older dude said, we're going to go fallow deer shoot and you need to buy a centerfire. And I thought, oh, pff, I di- didn't know too much. Oh, well, I knew a fair bit about it from reading books, but that's about it. Anyway, a bloke had a 6.5 by 55 Swedish Morza mm. uh, and it had a sports stock on it. It came with about 40 rounds and it was in a box he'd made himself, like a case with some terrible foam. It used to sweat in there a bit um, for 300 bucks Great and with a scope on it. And I thought, well, I bought that. Um, and I sighted it in, and from about 150 metres, um, I sighted it in on paper, and then there was a native hen. You're not allowed to shoot them in Tasmania anymore, but at this stage it was about 150 metres aimed dead on, and it turned this thing inside out so its skin was on the – and I thought to myself, oh, that's pretty reasonable. And I and I'd shot – it took me two years to shoot a fallow deer with it, I, but I didn't pull the trigger on it either. We were on some pretty poor properties early on. Um, but that 6.5 by 55 was sniggered at by all my mates mm. and, and a lot of people. But I, I found I could shoot that so accurate. It was no recoil. Mm. Um, I, I got really comfortable with it. I shot a lot because it was cheap to shoot at the time. I shot a lot of rounds with it at mates' farms and made sure that I was comfortable with it. And that, that was fine. And that was in an era where, you know, four or five years uh, later, everyone was on the 300 wind mag train. Like everyone in Tassie was shooting fallow deers with the 300 wind mag. And I'm like, what? That's big Why? Eyes. Like, I mean, Jesus. And I used to giggle a bit because all my mates would get me to side them in. And um, I'd, I'd think, why, why is that? And they were just, you're a I big think, a little bit concerned. Yeah. Well, I just think they didn't like pulling, like prone. I just didn't think they liked pulling the trigger. And I found out by accident, like, I got a guy to go, right, oh, that's pretty sweet there now have a bit of a go. So we laid down and there was a bit of confusion and I thought I'd put a fresh round in, but it was just a case in there. And when he pulled the trigger, the flinch was insane and I just said, look, there's no wonder you're going to have to come back down and and shoot my 6.5 or triple two before you start trying it. And it was a beautiful thing. It was a Seiko. He'd spent, back in the day, he'd spent drug money on this thing. It was like $3,500 for this Seiko. It was a beautiful thing. Three shot, which I thought was a bit cheap. Because my uh, I could put six in the six point five, which was party time when when we get onto a good property. But um, it's just crazy that people go so high in the calibers. Having said that, I've got a little bit of a hole, and I don't know whether I should go uh, seven mil oh eight. But what's your advice? If like I've, I've what's gone, your hole? Uh, what's your top? Of, like what's well, your Well, I, I want to go silly. I, I've got no reason to, but I want to go and shoot. What were you Samba. talking? What were those baits you were talking about? Where you've got like realistic ones, and then you've got the what do you call them? <laughs> oh, the um, the coloured like the crazy baits. You got like oh, normal the, ones that imitate, and then you've the, got the um, fish cakes. No, no, you went higher than yeah, that. Just oh, stupid, for two, you... stupid looking lures. Yeah, oh, they look looking. like a look like a bloody dead glar. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's, so that's what you well, want to do with your gun. Well, no, I've got a I've got a twenty two. That's a nice. Samba. I've got a nice old. Uh, 22 CZ, like the early one that's done no work with the hogback stock timber. I'm a real timber guy. And so, I, I, look, if I was going to go up and down the mountains or do a lot of shooting, I'm sure I would go, um, you know, plastic stocks or whatever you call them. But, um, it doesn't make a difference for guys yours and my size. We're already carrying extra. 
Yeah, but I, I, I just love timber. Like, yeah. I just, I grew up with timber guns. I've, I've read, Dad had a thing called the Shooter's Bible, which is an American book about that thick. Mm-hmm. Didn't have the cover on it. I read the thing from back to front. It was just black and white, uh, pictures and everything was a timber stock and, and there wasn't a, a, a plastic stock in there anyway. So I, at, as an agent, I used to go around and I'd accidentally find these things like the early CZ. With the hogback, uh, you know, the real slender four stock and the hogback um, cheek piece, mm-hmm. um, found that, stole it for three hundred bucks. I, I, another, and so then I've got a. The only brand new one I've got is a. Um, it's a CZ four five something, four five seven in the varmint with the funny stock that you, that's straight up and down right. with the with the heavy barrel the vertical pistol grip thing. Yeah, yeah, I, I love it. It's awesome. I've put a spastic scope on it. I, I really love shooting it. But I bought that to shoot foxes. Never shot a fox. Uh, yeah. go. That was pretty wild. What was that? That was something falling off the speaker. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, we definitely heard that was a lot louder than your chair earlier, Dylan. Let's see. Yeah, hey. and I've got a an interesting one I found by accident, which is a a Mauser action. In 2506, now I don't know whether any of your listeners would yeah. have ever heard of a bloke called um, Bill Hambly Clark. Right. Bill Hambly Clark was a, an old South Australian uh, gunsmith who had kudos and written a book, a book that is highly regarded on centrefires in America, like very highly regarded. Um, and, I, and I just happened to see this funny uh uh, rifle on the on at a Bothwell gun store, which is uh, in the Midlands in Tasmania, Midlands. and it had a weird, it had a it had a weird fiberglass stock on it, so totally out of character for me. But I just thought that's pretty cool, and it had the inscription on it, Bill Hamley Clark Jr. And I thought that must be who someone had it made for their birthday. Turns out it's the gunsmith. Turns out he was a bit of a freak when it came to centerfires. He's built this thing back in the day, and accidentally found out that he'd shot two lions in Australia. So some lions escaped from the South Australian zoo at the time and the cops who were all freaking out rang him and he, he shot two on the run with this, uh, looked like a pump action with uh, Brentke slugs in it. From It's on video. You can search it on YouTube mm. and it actually shows the lion dragon, the trainer, that the lions ate the night before. And they woke up, couldn't find the lines. The trainer was missing, um, and it's on YouTube, black and white. All the cops are there with their three hundred three still in the paper, and it's I've just heard crazy. That story. It's crazy. Oh, it's crazy! And I've got one of his guns, and I'm going to put a um, a timber stock on it because the fiberglass stock is heinous. It's just, just for those crazy. for those that are listening. Dylan is still here. Uh, he's just yeah, formulating just. his answer on what he likes about the twenty five odd six. So yeah, guess, what uh, do you think about the twenty five oh six, Dylan? Uh, look, uh, the nice range 25 of numbers. Twenty five or six? Yeah, twenty five <laughs> and six are good numbers. <laughs> yeah. Uh, if you it subtract six from twenty five, you get your age. No, you don't. It's nineteen. I'm a year older. <laughs> yeah. You can't. I, I, we'll no, no, I just wanted you to do the maths on we'll, that. We'll, Go uh, on. We'll, what's we'll, the lure called? Uh, so I've done some research. Lure, yep. The umbrella rig or the Alabama rig. So pretty well much it's like um, just like literally you got one bit of wire, then you got like six bits coming off, and they've all got like their own certain hook on them, and they just run like plastics on it. And like they are like seriously crazy. Like they've got like little metal blades in it. So it's just like a school of fish swimming past. And I was interested, so I did some research, and they are – illegal in Tassie, you're only allowed two lures on one line. So okay. you can make your own. It's just got to have two lures on it. Can the others be teasers? Why is the balloons coming off all these screeches? Because you, you put the peace <laughs> sign up and you're on your phone. <laughs> what <happened> there? <laughs> <laughs> this happened on a, for those that are listening. What's happened is Dylan's just given us the peace sign, and because he's filming on his phone, his camera's recognised that he's uh, celebrating Baitcaster Day, and it's put some balloons up for him. On the that is awesome. Well, you learn something every day. <laughs> I was looking at. It, I'm like, am I okay? Am I falling asleep? Uh, um, uh, that is that is out there. Oh well, yeah. I went from where were, <laughs> where were we? Where were we? Twenty-five, <laughs> Balloons, six. So, oh. Kelly, uh, 
What's the noise? Uh, that's my daughter going to get me a drink. All oh, right. Water. Yeah, right. It's a, it's a weeknight. No, it is, actually, I'll get her to put a little tablet of uh, something in it because since I've had this gastric <laughs> sleeve operation, you need to take in a fair few minerals and bits and pieces that you don't get through your food. Get some you know what that calls me. for. That's it. <laughs> right. <laughs> Where, where's the balloons? <laughs> <laughs> Look at him. He's like, <laughs> I was going to say he's like a kid in a candy shop, but he's just, uh, he is a kid anyway. Yeah. Right. So, qu- question time. I put it out to the boys today that uh, had you guys coming on. Now, there's 19 questions in this one question from Josh, who is a friend of mine who really only shoots pigs in State Forest, but he does well. Short questions, so we answer them real quick. They are short questions, but I'm just going to, like, dump them all. Nah. Righto. Best time of day to catch trout. You want me? Uh, Falling light or or falling light. Or yeah, go one eight. Rising light. Okay. Yeah, nah, Falling light, light rising light. Well, no, and this is uh, hard bodies or plastics? I'm a hard bodies man. 100% depends on, hard bodies. Depends but, on Depends on your... This was his turn to answer, Hooch. Sorry, yeah. Exactly. It depends on your area. Like, if I'm fishing a rocky area, I love to fish hard bodies because I find if you get a good hard body that vibrates really well and you fish it over rocks, that vibrate will go off a lot more wider than, you know, just a soft plastic with no rattle. But what, like weeds and reeds and old like gra- seagrass, stuff like that, probably more plastics. So but they yeah. absorb the vibration. They've each, they've each got their own space, but if I had to pick one to fish with for the rest of my life, it would definitely be a hard body. Righto. And lure technique, Hooch, for uh, trout? I'll do one for kids. If you take kids trout fishing and you use soft plastics, mm-hmm. the speed that they wind them in when you tell them not to let wind at all, that speed that kids will wind is perfect speed for trout because kids never, when they cast something out, they must bring it back in. So you, they'll cast it out and you just turn around and you look at them and you say, now don't you wind that in and deliberately look away from them and ignore them and the kids will, they'll be winding, winding it in and they'll be seen if dad's looking and that's the perfect speed to catch a trout. Right. Uh, fishing upstream or downstream? Always. I like, like if I'm ever fishing. Are you, rivers, are you cast? Sorry, casting up or yeah, casting casting down? up? I will like not like I will try to avoid it for the life of me casting downstream. Like some spl- some stages, obviously it's all right. Like if the water's moving slow, but if you're trying to find fo- like if you're fishing relatively fast water. Like, just casting downstream, it's just not going to work. Like, your lure's not going to swim right. It's not going to look realistic because you've got a little tiny lure that's jumping out of the water, swimming up against fast currents. So, like, upstream, pretty much only for me anyway. Right, yeah, Hooch. Uh, target area in the river. What am I looking for? Uh, water coming in, whether it be a, a little stream or even water running off a paddock. More often than not, in fresh water, that fresh water, if you've had a fresh rain, will be bringing food in. Um, the trout will just be sitting, waiting for it. They're fairly lazy. They'll be in behind a rock or they'll be in under a bank. And that's another reason why Dylan will be casting upstream because you're trying to cast upstream and bring your um, bait or lure down and they'll be just there waiting to ambush it. Radio, um, I think we covered this, how to handle them once you've caught them. Yeah. Pretty Break the neck and put them there, Ski. <laughs> if you're gonna I was release, going to go with wet hands. <laughs> yeah, if, you, if, you, if you're going to release trout, yeah, wet oh, your hands. Sorry. Try sorry. and try and yeah. that's that's actually that like I've I've never heard anyone say what Hooch said earlier on about like as soon as you pull the fish out of the water, like take a breath and as soon as you feel like you're about to die, put the fish back in. That's something I've never actually heard being said before. That's actually like really good information. Because especially with like a camera or something like that, it's easy to quickly forget. You go, oh, yeah, get a good one, get a good one. And then you like the fish slips out of your hand then you pick it back up. And then you're like, oh, yeah, get a good one. And then a minute's pass. And it's like if you're trying to breathe, well, unless you're a very good so at they... holding your breath, you're probably struggling. So, mm. um, No, he's a bit vague on this one. Key things to look for to find the fish. And I think we covered that with, you know, water coming in. But if you haven't got any water coming in, are you looking for 
Uh, still water, moving water, eddies off the side, uh, swirling you go, water. Um, there you go, deal. You go, oh, deal. Like, like, um, like if we're talking, if we're talking it lakes, works. it's got to fish it differently. If we're talking lakes, you know, you're mainly looking for structure. Like, one thing with fishing lakes that's really handy is look at which way the wind's blowing, because you'll get your big lakes and you'll have, it'll blow straight, like, like say it's been blowing southerly, southerly, southerly. So that shore on the southern side is going to have all, like, so much food and, like, everything pushed up on it. Like, yeah, it's harder to fish because you've got the wind coming behind you. you got to try and stay away from the shore. But I can guarantee you, you will find so much more fish on that bank that is getting hammered by the wind and it's rocky as, uh, like, your boat shaking and stuff like that than what you would, you know, just going up the calm and fishing nice and calm. But, like, on rivers and stuff That's like that. That's a good, good point because people think lakes don't have current, but essentially the wind yeah. is doing it yeah, the wind minutely. Is current. Yeah, the wind is current. And we don't even feel and, it. And, um, yeah. like, it's interesting too. Like, I'll watch the weather before I'm even, like, the days before I'm fishing there. Like, some of the really big lakes in Tassie, like, say it blows, like, you know, like the same way for the last three days and then it changes the day that you're fishing, a lot of people will go to the bank that you are actually fishing but not realise that a lot of the food's already been flown to another shore, so there's still fish that are actively mm-hmm. feeding on that shore because, you know, there's been so much food pushed down there recently. Um, But, like, in rivers and stuff like that, you know, any, like underground sort of banks where the banks you can see that the banks like sort of come out like or trees covering the water just trying to get into as much structure as you can without getting snagged or casting into a tree all right and last one on this section for you hooch because i know you've done a fair bit of sport fishing um if you want to taxidermy a fish or get one mounted in that capacity if we're talking trout versus sport fish. I know with the sport fish now, they're usually just using measurements and molds. But with the trout, are they doing the same? Or are we, you know, is there still guys doing skin molds, uh, skin mounts and things? Depends on what you want to do and how much you want to pay. But, yeah, they'll do anything you want, really. Those guys that are taxidermists are pretty freaky when it comes to art and how they want to go about it. Some of the some of the bigger molds with the sports mounts, they've got enough molds they've done over the years that they can tell people, you know, this – off a measurement, and I'll do a mould off a off a um, off a fish they've already caught. But some people would like to tick that box and and get the actual fish done, which is a big a fair bit of work. So it's principally uh, much of a muchness. I remember though going back to hunting, the first ever deer I had mounted looked like they'd stretched the skin out over a gumboot full of plaster of Paris, and now they're just amazing. Like the the last year I had done the veins in the neck and the eyes and the whiskers. It's just got like chalk and cheese. Who one did looks that like I've done it. Uh, I can't remember his name. There's not many down there. But he was in Westbury. He's got a big shed in Westbury and he's very, he was a short fella, dark hair. Um, sorry, Hagley. Hagley. Um, it's an art and he, form, isn't it? And I think they're all yeah. a little bit like to be a taxidermist and spend your life hanging around dead animals. I think it's a bit like being a chef. You've got to be a little bit different because, you know, you, you just, I don't know. It, it's yeah, very much so. It, and it and they are is. artists. On the fishing it, side of it, I, um, I've got some more questions for you around horror stories, but one of my better fishing stories ever was I had absolutely no idea what I was doing. I had bought a fishing licence about 15 minutes before going down to this bit of water. I was at Malacuda, which you mentioned earlier, Hooch, and uh, right off the point there, just below, there's like a little bench chair. We were camping there at the caravan park. Right down the bottom, I had three fishing rods because I was productive uh, by myself. And I baited them all up with a little bit of prawn. I threw one in and then put it on under that foot. And then I was getting the other one ready. I threw that one in and put that under that foot. And then as I was getting the other one ready, the one on my left foot just got taken out of my foot. I was like, oh, I must, you know, got a decent fish. And I thought, I'll get that in a second. And in my corner of my eye, I saw this fishing rod start to disappear and head out to water. I end up, I catch it, caught a 40 centimetre brim, which I didn't know is a pretty damn good brim. Yeah, um, it's a massive brim. 
Well, I didn't know that. And I also didn't know that they're freaking old. Like the age of a 26-year-old brim apparently is, I can't remember what the answer was now, but like 20 plus years old or something to get to that 14 years or something. It took a long time to get to that size. And I felt a bit bad for killing it, but it tasted okay. Um, but I wanted to get it mounted. And once I found out it was a good one, but I'd already eaten it. So I rang uh, this guy called Anthony Valley Taxidermy in Melbourne and he said, how big was it? I said, 40. And he said, did you measure it? I said, yeah, it was 39.5, but we, we round up. And he said, oh, it's fine. I've, he said, I've got a mould for every centimetre from 35 to like 45. Um, so like you were saying, he's already got them pre-done and you just put the order in for whatever size. And I never got it done because it was the same price as getting a fallow deer mounted. Uh, and... Personally, I probably thought that was a little bit too expensive considering it's fiberglass mould that he then paints. But, um, you know, I don't know the, what it takes to paint a mould either. I'm not doing it. but Yeah, it, it takes but, a little bit. They airbrush it and they and they go and then they'll finish it off by hand with a little bit of um, extra dexterity and, and art form. But it's it's not like a punch them out thing, but it, 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 it is a little bit better than the skin mould. Now, with taxidermy and, and uh, animals that have been presented, do you know where the most impressive uh, taxidermy collection pre nineteen forties was in the southern hemisphere? I feel like it's a Tasmanian answer, but no. Corn Hall, Corn Hall, Tasmania, and wow. so Corn Hall was this massive property um, in the Midlands, and um, I've never seen it or, or, or been there, but but uh, legend says that the great grandson of the people that well, that's probably great great grandson of the last owners that were naming rights to that, uh, their young son in his 20s, about your age, Dylan, would travel the world uh, just shooting everything. And there's even some uh, animals in there that weren't even discovered. I was, uh, and this is this is fair thinking. He's got some animals named after him because he bought them back and people had not seen them before. And so that, that might be worth a little bit of an interesting story for me yeah. to follow up on. And, yeah, and send, me, to send me the details of that. Yeah, Corn oh, Hall. Yeah. It's spelled Q U O R N, and now it's one of the uh, it's one of the premier fallow deer shooting properties in Tasmania. Yeah, right. And also, it's like in the middle of at the back of Campbelltown, the middle of Tasmania. And and back in the forties, it used to have its own racetrack as well. So it's a pretty interesting. You did just say Campbelltown, didn't you? Campbelltown. Okay, so we have a Campbelltown near where I live, and it's not where you'd want to go to see. No, here. no, I've heard that. Um, yeah. Um, we're running a bit long on time, but I've got a. There's a story I wanted to tell tonight, and the only reason I got you on, none of this has been relevant, was to tell this one story. But I'll get to that because I want you to feed into it. Um, I had a horror story recently. It's a fishing related one, and I can't tell it without it being a fishing related. So uh, I want to ask you about any horror stories. I feel like Dylan spent most of his life on shore. Have you done much boating stuff and had any uh, like boating related bad stories? Yeah, I've 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 had one smart one. I'm sure, Hooch has had a few. Um, Go. So I've I've got like a four point two meter tinny that I run all of my lakes and stuff like that out of, and um, was up Lake Echo, which is a lake in the Central Highlands of Tassie that's cuts up relatively bad, and um, me and a couple of mates were up there camping, and then we were decided that nah, we're going to go back, and I. Uh, Came in, put the put the boat up, pulled it up, tied it up, and um, the wind was blowing directly across from the boat ramp. And I was about uh, probably a kilometre walk from the patrol because, uh, like, it was there wasn't really any campsites close. Not because of people, just because of you know like not much access. access. So we sort of went a bit further, and I walked there, and I got back, and then when I got back, my boat was probably about. 50 metres from shore, just floating directly across the other way. And, um, yeah, we, long story short, no one else there had a boat and some random person had to come with a boat and it was literally like just getting on dark that we actually got across to the other side and we saw it on the other side of the, um, of the other side of the lake. And then, like, I had to, like, jump out this is like probably about a three four five degree day and i've had to like jump into the lake 
like pull my boat out because it was like on on the on the land. I had to like pull it out, twist it off, and then get get back over the other side. But yeah, that was that was probably about the dumbest thing I've ever done. Um, so now, but whenever did you regret I regret not learning how to tie knots when you were at <sighs> Scouts. Was it tied yeah. to a branch or what happened? What made it cut loose? I yeah, I just genuinely I don't even like I. I got I pulled it up, I tied it, and then I just came back and like I don't even know, like I didn't really look at the rope that well until I got back. I don't know whether it just like teared a little bit or and snapped or yeah, it's just horror, just dumb decision. It's a really. long long day. At least you had reception to ring someone. Yeah, else. yeah. Go on, Hooch. Tell us your worst one. Well, it was. I've had a few bum puckering, bum puckering moments uh, at sea, but this story isn't my story. But it, every time this chap tells it, it affects me. I get goosebumps when he tells it. So you might not have heard of him, but Michael Newell and Matt Newell, they were on a cooking show many years ago as a father and son team, and he now is on a radio station down here in Hobart, Mick Newell. He, in a previous life, was an abalone diver, and they used to dive um, around Whale Head, which is quite south. Um, and they were coming back from an area which was, um, I think they were diving in and around Pedro Branca, which is a which is the last stop before New Zealand, pretty much. Um, and they were diving. There's a big pinnacle comes up. And they're heading back, and they've got these two big as Avalone divers. They're all two Bob Lairs. They've got this catamaran with these two big powerful motors, and they're going full noise. And they used to have a bar or some sort of a system in which this bar would steer both. Uh, motor, so you'd only have the hydraulic steering on the one motor, and the bar would do the work. That, of course, puts a lot of load on that that junction, and and I think that broke or something happened, and both motors went instant hard left or hard right. I can't remember, but of course that that action of those motors while they're going one way threw them both out of the water. They're like eight nautical miles from anywhere, and, and they both took them off without them. No time to get, um, you know. I'd imagine. Because it was a boat over seven metres, no life jackets. They had the wetsuits on. You know, they were young and bulletproof um, and the boat's just heading off. And and the, the mate that he was with was, you know, it wasn't long and they were, saying, you know, crying and saying their goodbyes and this was it. And then they noticed that the catamaran just started to come back around and do this slow circle. And then by some freak bit of fate, it came back on the same sort of apex turn and, and arc and one of them decided that they would try to climb up on this thing. I can't remember which one it was. I think it might have been Mick. Um, clam it up. And m- m- mind you, you've got two giant human egg beaters that are, want to just moulay you to pieces at the back of the boat and he, and he actually managed to clamber on, picked his mate up uh, after saying their goodbyes to the world and then Jerry rigged some steering system and made it home. And every every time he tells that story, given some of the bum pucker moments I've had, so I just get goosebumps when he tells it. It's just, just uncool. That's crazy. Yeah, it's nuts. And he tells it really well, being a radio host and a bit of a character. Oh, that was pretty well. I'll uh, I'll take your word for it. I had uh, so I just come up. I just come back from Darwin. I spent a couple of weeks up there, and. Yeah, like fishing's not my forte, but these clients I had, we did a buffalo trip from Texas, seven days out there, and then we went to Dundee Beach for a two-day fishing charter. <coughs> and I hadn't used this guide before. Uh, I had a booking agent that I used up there for my fishing trips, and the guys I had used before were busy, I booked, so we ended up with this new guide. Um, so anyway, I had no history or didn't even know what we were walking into boat-wise, and uh, he met us at... We stayed at the Novotel in Darwin and met him and he, real nice guy, young fella, keen, and um, Steve's his name. And, you know, we, we headed out. It was an hour and a half out to Dundee and we stayed the night there and then we got up in the morning and, and headed out <coughs> fishing. And it's a it's a horrible time for fishing at that, like this was, you know, four weeks ago. Right now it's a terrible time for barramundi fishing. They're all there but they're just hunkered down. They're not really interested in eating or taking lures or anything. And we fished hard for two days and we come up with about eight, you know, 400 mil long um, mackerel. Like he'd nearly call it a, a donut. It was, it was, and Steve tried, like 
you know, he did everything he could. Um, we were changing spots and chasing. We went 75 Ks out at one point with this open top single motor. You know, the water was crystal. We had the best conditions. Uh, I'm not a, you know, I get seasick on a rough tide just down at the local lake, but it's um, it was nice because it didn't affect me. But, you know, we, we tried everything and the, the wife, she hooked onto a, what we can only assume was a stingray at some point because it just ripped her and then sat there. Um, and we were chasing Jewies at the time, so it wasn't one of them and it broke off. But on their way back once, we uh, I said, what's that over there? Anyway, it was a sailfish fin in the middle of nowhere, it just sunning itself, you know, stretching up and whatnot. So we tried and played around with that. For The problem was we were going somewhere and then we saw that, so it preoccupied us. We spent hours trying to get this one or two sailfish that we could see. The client hit it in the head twice with the popper. Um, like... He was he's a he was a great fisherman and he just we were I don't know how far he was casting let's say 30, 40 meters he's only like two or three mil off on his cast and he would have been further in front of it but no he hit it in the head twice um, so this thing took off and he was pretty bummed about that because he's from Texas whatever really wanted to catch a barramundi but he'd also never caught a billfish so he was pretty keen to do that and that wasn't our target that was just you know a bit of blue water anyway we went back up. One of the streams, um, it's called um, Innes, the Innes River, Big Innes or something. And well, sorry, we tried to go in there the previous day, but um, the the tides changed so much there that the channel that you go in on that he had marked in his GPS had moved slightly. Uh, he was following his GPS and we hit, you know, with shallow water and we had to bail out of there. The tide was a bit wrong. So we didn't get in there that day. And the second day we got in, we went in earlier and um, – the deal was once we're in, we've got to stay in because the tide drops, you can't get out. Uh, so that was fine. We stayed in. We saw so many crocodiles. It's just big ones, like I want to say five-meter crocs on the side of the water, just ginormous. These guys went on a croc tour and they didn't see crocs this big. But getting to the point. So we'd had a, a pretty miserable fishing trip as far as actual catching fish. Um, and on our way out, another boat, got sanded, got um, got stuck on the sand and was there for an hour or so while we were still fishing but waiting for the tide to come up. Tide come up and he got out and another boat came in and then Steve's like, oh, we'll tie enough now. We'll be fine. And I could see that boat's wake as we were heading out. Like they leave that line. It had been gone for a minute or so, but it left this line through the water. And we weren't following it. We were a little bit off. I was like, I don't know what's happening. Oh, has it drifted? And we're in the channel. Anyway, we're full steam, 40 k's an hour or something, and he hits the sand, and it all threw us forward on the boat, um, and we stopped just on the spot. And, you know, it wasn't hard. He, he didn't even have to hop out. He just got us back in the channel, and we kept going. Half an hour later on it, well, this is 4.35 o'clock in the Arvo, half an hour later on their way back to the ramp, and his motor just stops. No warnings, nothing, stops. And he, you know, fiddled around with some things and it got started again and and then we went another little bit, but it was limping. It wasn't at full performance and then it stopped. It's a 150, uh, yeah, it was 150 something, <coughs> Suzuki, whatever. I'm not a motor person. And, but, and that stop was a big one. That was a big bang. Oh. And he put the piston through the head. And blew what the engine. Color was the, what but color was the engine? Silver. Yamaha, probably. maybe. Anyway, I'll find your photo. Yamaha. Yamaha. <laughs> what did I say, Suzuki? I'm a fisher. Um, Yamaha. Anyway, it was pretty new. He bought it in March, and we were in wow. July. Um, yep. Anyway, not his problem. Like not his. Not his, I shouldn't say his problem. It was all of our problem. Yeah. Uh, it wasn't his fault specifically. Mm. Um, yep. And anyway, he only knew that was, but. I reckon we had an oil slick big enough to kill every penguin within a kilometre. Like it, it was, there was no fixing. The, and we were 10 Ks from where we needed to be. I could see it. I could see it in the distance. And we were pretty calm about it. We we're like, oh, what do we do? Like we'll wave down a boat. Anyway, a boat went past us and we waved and didn't respond, like didn't look at us or anything. And then he was trying to fiddle around with the motor. I was like, oh, we'll just, you know, he'll ring someone. And, you know, he contacted his mate, but his mate was in Darwin which is two hours away and whatnot. And it wasn't really, nothing was really happening much. We were kind of just floating. We had a trolling motor on. So we're going at 1.2 Ks an hour at 
six o'clock at night. I was doing that maths. So that was going to be dark against the tide. And I said, this is the politest way I could say it. Would you be offended if I did some problem solving? I thought that's a pretty fair way to say I've got an idea, but I don't want to be rude. It's your boat. It's your, you know, your deal. And, you know, what are you going to do? You know, I said, well, I just want to ring. I'll just ring the pub and say next boat that comes into the ramp because it was high tide. Everyone was coming in because if you miss the tide, you can't get the ramp. I said, um, next boat that comes in, you know, dinner and drinks are on us. Send them out. Come get us and tow us in. We'll sort it out later. Um, oh, no, give us some time. I'm waiting for your mate to get back to us. Anyway, I've never felt stranded in life. Like your car breaks down, whatever, you're on the side of the road, you've got a phone. You get lost in the bush. I can't say I've ever really done that, but I've been a little bit turned around. You can always walk. Mm. If you're stranded in the ocean, you have nothing. Yeah. And I had good, I had two bars of reception. Um, and Steve didn't have as much. I think he's with Vodafone or something like that. But the other thing that he didn't have, and there's no real good way to say it, is he didn't have his antenna for his radio. Mm. He'd forgotten it. So, and we've all forgotten. Like, I can't blame him for it. It's a big thing to forget, admittedly, and it's a safety thing, and I think it's even legal, like illegal to not have. But he'd forgotten it, and he just didn't pack it. Um, he actually told me that the day before and I didn't think too much of it, but that was the main issue because you would just radio someone, you know, go out to yeah. the local channel and yeah. someone would come and get you. Um, anyway, so we, ended up, we saw a boat. It was just, just before I was about to ring someone because I was getting a bit sick of waiting. Um, we saw a boat about a K and a half off heading to shore and we pulled a flare we, oh, we said, imagine if there was some way we could flag it down and we're like looking for rain jackets that are fluoro or something. And he's like, oh, I've got flares. Oh, okay. Anyway, so I got a flare and we popped that and they come over and, and towed us in. But And I sort of said on the way back, I'm like, can I throw a lure out and we can troll? Because this is trolling speed. <laughs> like, we, we, we don't want to waste an opportunity here. You, sound, uh, but, you say you're not a fisherman. You sound like a fisherman to me. That's I'm just opportunistic. Like, yeah. <laughs> um, but I just, I don't know, I've, I've never felt as stranded as I did in that. I wasn't worried because... Like we, I had reception and we're 10 Ks offshore and we could put an anchor down. Like we're not, we weren't in deep water. Um, I wasn't going to swim to shore. I could see shore too. Yeah. I wasn't going to do that, but it's, uh, there's too many crocs up there to be doing that. I don't know. It was, it's just the, the only time I've really felt stuck in life in that situation. And then what didn't help was the clients I was with telling, cause they're fishermen back home and he was telling stories while we're sitting there and one what could have made that story worse was we were seventy five k's offshore earlier that morning. Imagine if it happened out there. Yeah. Yes, yeah. That's a, that's a no go zone. That's a yeah. wait days until someone happens to go past or float to shore, hopefully. But he told this other story of uh, some guys were doing. They were going offshore late one Friday night, and they put their boat in cruise control, and they just cruised for you know hours all night. They were just it would have just pulled up when they got there in the morning. They all went to bed. And they were woken up at two o'clock in the morning by water. The boat was sunk. They were, they hit a submerged shipping container at full pelt. Oh wow! Yep. And just ripped the bottom of the boat off. And they were sinking. They they woke up in their beds in water, and they floated and they got a life jacket each. Uh, and that was it. That's all they had: a life jacket. And they all had little POBs or something on their thing. But that happened at two o'clock in the morning, and they had to wait until I think it was twelve hours before someone got there to get them. Um, and they're like middle of nowhere. And he said, like, this is him recalling the story of his friend, but you're paddling water and you're hanging on, like clipped all each other on together in a circle, six or seven of them. And you'd fall asleep from the exhaustion, from the adrenaline and then the crash, right? You were just wrecked. So they were falling asleep, but your mate next to you would kick his leg and you'd wake up real quick because you thought you were losing yourself to a shark. Yeah. But, uh, oh man, deep, like I really like land and, um, well, you can might, just you can yeah. just get out and walk at any instance, but yeah. when, when you're in at sea, you just you can't. You need rescuing. Yeah. And I've got a pretty cool story. And I know I know we're getting on for time, but you might have to split this to a part one and part two. This podcast, but this story it, it reminds me. Actually, I was in a um, Caribbean crest cutter, which is an old fiberglass boat about five and a half meters. And I've done I've done a lot of actually I, I actually um, I swapped a a, a a combination gun that I really regret it was a bruno 
It was a Bruno it's like a combination four, twelve, four, 12 gauge. A, no, no, twelve gauge three. on the bottom. No, twelve gauge on the bottom and seven by fifty-seven uh, on the top. Yeah, but it you came should have regretted that. Oh wait, it gets worse. It was in a really nice box, the the proper box, and it had a second set of barrels, which was an under and over uh, twelve gauge. And I I bought it originally just for um, breaking clays. And when I used to take it breaking clays, I'd go to the gun clubs and I'd drag it out. And it had this interesting. It wasn't a box lock, but it was an interesting way in which it locked. Mm-hmm. It opened and shut. It had this wild thing going on, and all the old guys were just. Loving it, going, what do you got there? And I said, it's an old Bruno combination gun. I said, what do you mean combination gun? And I bring out the other box and show them the other barrel, which was this short, stubby barrel with a bottom 12 gauge designed for shooting slugs and yeah. the 7 b 57 um, like mortar, a pig, I imagine. Yeah, pig gun. Yeah. yeah on, oh, that's what I bought it for. I've, I've bought three different pig guns and never gone pig shoot. It makes me furious. I had a, um, a Marlin in uh, 45 70 lever action that I never, never. Come, circle back to your story. And so. <laughs> I'm out with this Caribbean. I'm out with this Caribbean crest cutter, and I'm, I'm I'm out with Moz, and we've used it off the northwest coast here. Um, he'd come up and we go flathead fishing. So I had an I had an idea of how much fuel it would use going out to a spot fishing, roaring around looking for different spots and coming home. And we were going down. He lives down Hobart. We're going out of um, Frederick. Uh, no, we weren't. We're going out of Fortescue Bay. And so I just took what fuel and extra fuel, and I thought, oh yeah, no worries. She's um, She'll be fine. But that trolling pace on a Caribbean crest cutter on a 90 CV Yamaha, they use, and I was only young, they use a ridiculous amount of fuel. And I, I didn't know this. So we're out trolling and it got really rough. It was, it already had about, and this will sound strange to mainlanders, but it already had three and a half metres, three to three and a half metres of rolling southerly swell on it which people would think, why would you go fishing? But that's a Tasmanian thing. That If you didn't go out in that swell, you just wouldn't go tuna fishing. So out we are and the wind starts to get up. It's 15 knots on top of three and a half metres, not so cool. Then all of a sudden it's 20 knots. Now she's genuinely whipping the water off the surface and it's just possibly a genuine 40 knots. And my, I, I am bum pucker. And try not to show it because the two boys that I was fishing with, they're townies. And they would panic at the mere sight of me panicking. I said, no, she's cool. She's cool. Meanwhile, I'm just going, I'm shit myself. <laughs> and then I'm trying to pull the rods in because I said, no, nah, she's time to get out of here. So my idea was to just go out on the um, the track we went, turn around and come back in the bay on the track that we, we left in. So I put Moz on the helm I got, and, and I'm reeling in the rods and the motor just cut out. <laughs> now we're a cork. And... The noise on the on the um, vinyl roof was like, <laughs> and no one could hear anyone. And he's yelling out, going, "Oh, the motor's cut down!" I'm going, "Oh no, no, really? Has it really? The motor's <laughs> cut out." And so I just said to him, "Don't yell out! Don't panic! It'll just be fuel!" And I just made that up. I didn't have a clue because I thought we'd have got lots of fuel. But luckily, I. While I was doing this, he's he's turned hard to um, starboard and he's gone up onto an area. We were in 70 metres of water. He went up on an area that was like 45, 35 and had a reef between these two things called the Hippolytes. And when that happens, the sea and the wind makes just a tumultuous mess and it jacks the swell up. And all of a sudden, I'm trying to get it going. I look up and I see this charter boat, which is about 40 foot of charter boat. All I'm seeing is the bottom of the charter boat. And he's rocking and rolling like this. And I could just tell, we knew that guy, and I could just tell he didn't know it's us. But he'd be saying, have a look at these idiots. He'd be going, and you wonder why people drown at sea. So I felt the um, the 20 litre container and it was dead empty. And I thought, oh, thank God for that. So I've swapped it over. I've pumped it a couple of times and I've yelled out uh, to to Mozza to start the engine now. And, of course, it ran dry so it wasn't going to fire up straight away. The carby bowls were all empty and I'd pumped it a few times but not enough to pump the carby bowls so it wouldn't go. And he starts panicking and I just – I was nearly after going to open hand slap him he was that bad. Finally got it to go. We finally got back in under the cover of the Hippolyte Cliffs and we were high-fiving ourselves like West Indian cricketers. We'd survived and we'd only got the one fish, which was a bit of a drama, but at least we got the one. Yeah, well, that's more to show for it than we had for that day, that's for sure. Oh, but it, it's it's not a good – even though I was putting up a lot of bravado, as skipper, you've got that extra pressure and you're like, you don't want to be that guy that's, <laughs> you know, been – 
you know, you got to you keep, know, it, all, keep it all in the, here. Uh, yeah, yeah. I, whereas the other two were just completely freaking out. It's like how Dylan keeps it together when you start a new story. He's just like keeping exactly. it. Just yeah, exactly. Or when I start it. hacking on him about his tattoos. Exactly. About, about his cat tattoo. Well, we, we, oh we've run out of time. We won't get you to show your tattoos, Dylan. Oh, yeah. I really appreciate uh, really appreciate you both coming on tonight. And it's been very informative. I've learned a bit. Seems like Dylan's learned a little bit about uh, yeah. Y2K and, and all sorts of things. 25 and 6. And Hooch has just had a good time. 25 and 6 is 19. <laughs> Good math. <laughs> Good work there. But, uh, math. So uh, before we go, how do the how do the listeners find you guys? Got the Snag podcast and Snag dot com, is it? Yeah. So we um so we've got uh snagged so we've got Snag podcast on YouTube, which is just our podcast that's like free to access. And we've also got www.snag.com.au dot au, and that is like a pay to um watch so we're going to be sort of doing like how-to videos and um pot like interviews with you know certain people that go fishing around australia and big fishing names and stuff like that and you know a bit more information on it like that plus we're also doing like a giveaway each week with um like shimano stuff and other sort of cool fishing gear and like if you yeah, part of your membership of buying, you know, into is, you know, you get a chance to, we give like fishing reels and stuff like that. Like the first week we gave away Shimano Stella, which is worth about one and a half grand. We gave away one of them. This week it was a Shimano Vantage, which is about $400. So good prizes. Thanks to Shimano for helping us out. So, um, yeah. If Exclusive you wanna... prize, that one, I believe. That was the first one in the country slash yeah. state. Yeah, they came out. Um, they came out literally just after, like last week, they were announced. So, yeah, for first in deals. That's a good deal. Well, yeah, not a we, bad. Deal. We might be able to do a uh, cross promotion dodge. We can have a talk to Thomas, and um, we could have a uh, prize for your channel. Come fish with Hooch, Dylan, and Thomas, I don't and you think can come along. I don't think they'd want teach, to. We could teach a few people. things. <laughs> well, they might do. Who knows? As long as we don't go way. offshore, I'll be checking the jerry cans. Oh, we can do whatever we anyone but, uh, wants I, I, to do. I was saying to Dylan before we started, uh, Tasmania is the only state I haven't actually been to, and the wife. We were only talking about it just the other day. Um, she's been as a kid, but we want to go back and take the family down, and we're looking at February next year. So, I'll uh, yeah. I'll be hitting you boys up for some uh, daddy daycare time, where I'll take the kids and we'll go and. Go and get some hooch special techniques, or well, uh, Dylan's the man on techniques. I just like to just kill. No, fish. I'll, I'll take Dylan along because he'll <laughs> hang out with the kids. But <laughs> oh, <laughs> I just wow. like to snap necks. Oh. Snap oh. necks. Yes, they, <laughs> nah, they can talk about what they're learning at preschool together. I'll get along with them. But just no, but it. we can tease that out because if we can get a bit of a, if you come down then and you get a listener, you might do a three month or a six month prize, and we can um, get them across to come fishing with us all. And then um, that's good because we can turn that around and we can go fox shooting and I'm coming. Yeah. Oh, I'll I, want to put, I want to put my 17 HMR to work. <laughs> yeah, let's do that. And uh, we'll get you up here and we'll do some samba hunting. Not something I've, uh, I'm have i very well versed in, but I've actually locked in a guest today and I won't mention him because people listening will try and work it out. But he's a uh, samba guru and I'll send you the link to that episode when it comes out. I'm keen to go pig shooting. Oh, I'll, I'll shoot anything. Doesn't worry me. Doesn't worry me. But uh, thanks, thanks for being on, boys. It's been a great night. And to everyone listening, cheers for now. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. it. Thank Where's you the balloons? Talk. One more time. So where the balloons? Get them. Get them going. Do it now. In the middle. Stop in front of, no, in front of your face. Do them in the middle. Oh, you ruined it. I've ruined no. it. Where's the? Yeah. <laughs> there it is. Oh dear. Look at these balloons. You. Yeah. No. <laughs> right, you guys stay there. I'll press stop.